Um, first of all, I want to welcome everybody tonight. Um, this is our first of, of three nights of what we're calling mini, <coughs> excuse me, mini workshops, and we'll on uh, Saturday, May seventh, we're going to follow it with a, an all-day uh, charrette, uh, a hands-on type of meeting. Um, just to, to, to go back quickly, the, the, the purpose of, uh, of why we are here, um, I think a lot of people, I can see a lot of familiar faces in, in the room tonight, some, some new faces, and uh, people who have been following uh, the Housatonic River uh, process for the last many years, I think a lot of people know uh, a lot of the information that's been put out, just uh, um, have been to meetings, have read things in the paper. There's also a, a good amount of people who really haven't followed it that closely, and I think with, uh, with now EPA moving into our, our decision-making mode, I think people are paying more attention. So uh, kind of the, the plan here is it's an opportunity for uh, EPA to get out uh, some of the information that we've, we've gathered, uh, along with GE's information that we, we've gathered over, over the years. We've been out working on the river, uh, studying the river a long time. Um, I'm going to present some of that information, but at the same time then we also, uh, particularly on the Saturday event, um, th there'll also be some times of question and answer tonight, but we're, we're looking to uh, gain information from the community, hear what people's concerns are. Um, let me just move this slide a second here. Uh, so just going back quickly to, to, where, to where we are today was that there's been many reports over the years as I think people have, have seen, have commented on, etc. Um, in October 2010, uh, GE submitted the revised corrective measures study, which was essentially the, the group of uh, the, the alternatives that uh, could be used to, to address the PCB contamination in the river and the floodplain. Uh, we held an informal public comment period. We've heard, heard from uh, a couple of hundred uh, people with comments, and we're continuing that process now. The charrette is part of, uh, of gaining feedback from the community as we move forward before EPA PA puts out a proposal, uh, hopefully this fall. Um, as, again, part of it is we, had, we did hire a, a consulting company called Certis Strategies. Uh, Steve Shapiro, who is over here who's going to be moderating the evening is uh, one of the principals at, at CERTIS and him and his team have been interviewing uh, people throughout the Berkshires uh, over the last couple of months and have been uh, helping us to gain some insight about what kind of information people are still looking for and what kind of issues uh, people have on their mind. So uh, one of the outcomes was it was it became clear to us that it was going to be useful to have some type of forum where we could get information into people's hands and have the opportunity to, to hear back uh, from people, not only in Pittsfield, where a lot of the action has been concentrated over the last number of years, but, but further down the river. So I think I've already kind of hit on what these goals are, really to provide people an understanding of the work that's been done um, opportunity to get your questions answered and an opportunity for us to hear back uh, <clears throat> with people, uh, from people hopefully will, who will have a better understanding of some of the issues as we, as we move through these couple of days. So we have three sessions. Uh, tonight, why working with the river processes uh, matters. Tomorrow, getting the facts on PCBs. Thursday, exploring alternatives for cleanup. And we have assembled our, a group of what we consider uh, uh, experts, people who've been working with EPA for many years, some for many years, some more recently, who really understand the river and are going to uh, uh, present these, these general areas today. Uh, we do have a, uh, a website called uh, uh, Housatonic, uh, uh, what, what is it called? <laughs> I'm blanking on it, uh, HousatonicWorkshops.org. And on that, uh, there is you know, information, uh, uh, more information about the specifics of, of the three nights of, of uh, presentations. So we ask people to visit that, um, that web page. Uh, we will be posting to it uh, the proceedings of uh, each night's meeting. There'll be a video. We'll be uh, posting any of the handouts that are uh, the work that are in the workbook tonight. Um, so folks who are not uh, able to be present at every night, uh, 
uh, can see what happened on the other nights. And we, we again, appreciate people make, taking the time to get here and, and know it'll be hard for people to get there every night. One other a quick note is that EPA has launched a, a Facebook uh, site this week, and it's called uh, EPA Housatonic. So if you're looking for that, there'll be, there'll be more information on the web. And that's not just going to last during the, the course of the workshop. That's going to be uh, ongoing into the, into the future. Um, the last thing I, I really wanted to hit on is, is this something that we're going to be talking about? Uh, we, we really want to uh, have people understand that we, we have some uh, decision criteria. When we're, we get to the point where we're going to uh, choose a cleanup plan, um, you know, put together the alternatives that make sense, that we have um, some standards that we need to, to measure them against. Nine evaluation criteria, um, they're specified in the RICRA permit, um, which is essentially the governing um, uh, piece of, uh, well, well it, it, it's the thing that's essentially it's all the rules for how we have to operate, and we really can't vary from that. Uh, quickly, the, the, the standards, and again, there's more information on our website about these. Uh, the, uh, there's a reference in the uh, work uh, workbook uh, where people are, are welcome and encouraged to go uh, read a little bit more about these. But the first one, overall protection of human health and the environment, uh, control of sources of releases, compliance with applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements, those meaning uh, regulations and, and rules that we need to uh, be mindful of w uh, when we're coming to a decision. Um, those are the general standards, so that's, those, that's kind of the baseline. The next ones um, that we need to consider are the long-term reliability and effectiveness of any of the alternatives, the attainment of uh, the interim cleanup goals, a reduction of toxicity, mobility, and volume, the short-term effectiveness of the alternatives, and whether they're, we're able to implement them, and then the cost. So we need to uh, consider all of those uh, criteria as we, as we move forward into comparing the alternatives and then making, uh, making a decision. Um, that's pretty much all I, uh, all I have to say. I'm going to turn it over to Steve. He'll talk a little bit more about uh, the logistics and the plan for the night. And I again welcome everyone and hope we can see you here as many nights as possible. Thanks. Is this working? Yep. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Again, my name is Steve Shapiro. I'm with the firm Certus Strategies, and we've been working with the EPA to help organize and produce these series of outreach programs and to organize and plan for the charrette uh, May 7th. I just wanted to um, take a minute. Everyone should have received what's titled Housatonic River Mini Workshop uh, in, inside. Uh, in the middle, there's um, a yellow page, which has questions, comment form. Uh, you could write as many questions as you want. There are pencils available. If you didn't get a pencil, if you don't have a pen to work with, we'll hand you more forms if need be. And I'll, I'll go back over the questions in a, in a moment. There's a blue form, which is... Uh, an opportunity for you to give some feedback and uh, evaluation of how the evening went as we move on through Wednesday, Thursday evening. Any feedback we can get to try to keep, keep things alive, keep things um, really focused to meet your interests, to meet your needs, is what we're trying to do. So we can't do that without your, your feedback. And at the bottom is the charrette registration form. Uh, we encourage you to register tonight for the charrette. You could also go to the website that Jim mentioned, www.husatonicworkshops.org. And just to uh, emphasize again what, what Jim said, the videos of tonight and every evening will be up on the website the next day. The PowerPoints, which were way too many um, to publish in a workbook, will be up on the website the next day. Um, the workbooks themselves will be up on the website. The workbooks contain a very, very informative, you know, hopefully you've had a chance to look at it already, but two-page technical summaries of that match each of the presenters' 
uh, work that they've put in to this effort. Bless you. <laughs> let, let me just um, go over the the questions. You know, t tonight is is geared towards the EPA's experts giving the community uh, what they've been working on for years, uh, as objectively and as independently as they can. Uh, the charrette is more of the t a two-way process where the EPA is really interested in getting your feedback into critical stages, critical pieces of their decision-making process. So that's why we're really building it up, because it, building it up in the sense that um, your your input, your your concerns are are critical to the overall decision-making process. We don't want to. Uh, we we can't say that enough. But tonight is about giving information to you and clarifying what is otherwise a very difficult, complex body of science, engineering uh, work that's been going on for years. And so we, we want to answer your questions. And the best way for you to do that is to really work and you know come up with what what's uh, in the way for you really grasping and understanding the information. There'll be people who will collect your questions. When you have them ready, just raise your hand. We try to stay relevant to this evening. Um, so if we're working with the history of the river, geomorphology or ecology, uh, or history of PCBs, you know, we, we'd ask that you stay focused on that subject. If you know you're not going to be here Wednesday or Thursday evening and have questions relevant to those evenings, I'm a, you know, feel free to write those down. We may not be able to, we're not going to be able to get to those tonight, but we'll defer it to the evening where it would be relevant, and then all the questions will get posted on the website. So we're going to have um, two, two speakers to lead off. Rich Donito and Keith Bowers will take a, a very short stretch break, bathroom break. The bathrooms are, if you go out there, right before you get into the lobby, there's men's and women's room. There's an extra women's room on this side. Um, and then two, two following speakers, uh, John Lordy and Dick McGrath. So we, we hope that you could stick around. If you have to get up or move around or use a restroom, please feel free to do that. So we'll have the, um, at each speaker will give about a 20 minute talk presentation using a PowerPoint format. And it'll be about five or 10 minutes following that for specific questions that you'd like to pose to that particular speaker. Uh, and then we'll move into the next speaker and we'll, we'll work that way through, through, the, through the four experts. And then when they're completed with their presentations, We'll bring everybody back out on stage and we'll have a short panel discussion, half hour, 45 minutes or so, depending on the level, nature, quantity of the, contra of the questions. Okay, so let me introduce our first speaker uh, of, of this experts. Sure. And if, and if I don't, I'll ask them to do it. Okay. So Rich Donito is a principal and owner of the Isosceles Group in Boston. Uh, Mr. Donito uh, has been working for more than 30 years in environmental, as an environmental consultant, and during the last 11 years uh, has been working on the GE Housatonic River, Resta River, in several roles, um, including project coordinator. Each of the bios are in the workbook for the evening. So I refer you to that. I don't want to take up your time to read the bios. Um, if there's anything that they could add regarding their, their background degree, I'll ask them to, to do that. But we will, we will we'll move on from there. So let me, let me um, take an opportunity to introduce uh, Mr. Rich Donito. So, um, just to add uh, a little bit more about my background um, in terms of qualifications, 
a bachelor's degree in geology, environmental science, and a master's degree uh, in the same field. I uh, also want to give credit to a co-author, John Field, Field Geology Services. He couldn't be here tonight. Uh, when I last spoke with him, he was in a boat in the Amazon River, uh, studying that river. Um, and, and John is, is, is one of the architects to some of the information uh, behind this presentation that I work with him on. Um, in any event, uh, I'm going to give a presentation about the history of the Housatonic River. Uh, obviously, we could spend many days going into great detail on the history, uh, so obviously this will be very brief, treetop level, focusing on some uh, very key um, activities that have occurred that we think are important to uh, present. So uh, the first thing, and, and I apologize, I'm going to have the microphone, a, a, a laser pointer, and the, uh, the slides, the slide sorter, the slide project, uh, a forward device here, so I'll be bouncing around between these. So the first thing I want to mention is that the, uh, the Housatonic River actually has existed for many thousands of years. Um, it obviously hasn't been here for millions of years, but it has been around for thousands of years, primarily since the glaciers, um, the ice sheets that were here of 14, 20,000 years ago melted and, and receded. And um, the topography of, of the upper Housatonic Valley was created uh, both during the ice advance and the ice retreat. And when the ice melted and retreated, you had a lot of ice dams, um, ice blocks, and, and large amounts of debris that was left behind uh, forming as a result uh, these various large glacial lakes, which occurred here in the western part of Massachusetts and into Connecticut. And, and one of the more prominent lakes was called Glacial Lake Housatonic. So we're looking at something that existed 14,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago. Um, the exact dates are not well known, and this is the, um, the light blue is the general area of where Glacial Lake Housatonic is theorized to ex have extended, um, and that lake would have left a lot of glacial lake bottoms in the valley here. And that had an effect on controlling where the actual river was going to end up being once the lake, um, you know, drained out after the ice dams uh, and the debris had, had moved along. And just to position yourself, Pittsfield's here, we're here, uh, Housatonic Mass, Great Barrington are located there. So when we look at the river today, we see this. It's very beautiful, uh, looks fairly pristine, like it's been here for thousands of years. Uh, but we know from, from looking at the information and the history, uh, this isn't the way it always looked. Uh, there's been a number of impacts that have occurred over the years. And essentially, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight in this presentation, is what are the human impacts to the river? And how has the river responded to that? So I'll bring up this timeline. It's a little busy. It's a little hard to see, perhaps, in the back. Um, but a copy of this will be on the website so you'll be able to take a closer look at it. And I, in some of the subsequent slides, I've actually blown up some of the key components so that we can see a little bit more of the detail. But the idea is, is that from the time that the glaciers retreated, uh, the first humans entered uh, North America, the Paleo-Indians, and then the European settlers, and then we have a series of different types of industrial activities that have occurred over time, and all of these things have had impacts to the river. And that's what we'll go through um, in the subsequent slides. So the first uh, humans that entered the, uh, the Housatonic Valley were obviously um, uh, the Native Americans, uh, initially called the Paleo-Indians. Um, uh, the oldest uh, radiocarbon dated evidence of them is 10,000, 10,500 years ago uh, to, the, to, the, to the Mohicans, were probably the last groups of Indians up in the upper Housatonic Valley. And people say, well, what impact would they have had to the river? Um, they did impact the river primarily as a result of building stone fish weirs uh, up and down the Housatonic. And I also want to mention that Housatonic is the Indian name um, that derived that means uh, the, the river beyond the mountains. So um, the Native Americans were actively involved in, in working with the river and putting in stone structures, uh, some that were very extensive. This is actually mapped. Um, a series of stone structures that were mapped down in Connecticut. Uh, we have evidence uh, in the cultural resource assessment that's been done uh, on the river. Um, there is evidence of uh, former uh, fish weirs, stone structures in the river, um, closer to this part of the portion of the river. Um, but these are stone structures. They would have impacted how the river flowed, slowed it down, um, caused it to move around a little bit. 
And they may have created, we, we don't know this for sure, but they may have created uh, wooden structures of this complexity. Uh, all of these things can impact how the river moves, albeit minor um, at, at that time. So moving along, obviously in the 1600s, early 1700s, the Europeans showed up, they moved in. What was that, in it? What was that impact? Well, the first impact is they started clearing the land. So the forests start coming down. Uh, obviously to build the settlements, initial settlements, obviously to put in farmland and uh, pastures for, for cattle and sheep and whatever. Um, so that forest clearing was sort of the first um, major activity that occurred in the, in the area that had an impact on the river. And important to note that by 1850, uh, almost 80% of the Berkshire County was completely deforested. And for a variety of reasons, not just for village settlements and agriculture and pastures, but for other activities which we'll talk about in a few more slides. And when you deforest the land, you increase the amount of material that actually drains into the river, and that has an impact on how the river flows and behaves. So this is an 1899 uh, artist's rendition, as if they were flying in a hot air balloon, um, of uh, the greater Pittsfield area looking northwest um, and you can see Silver Lake over here, Housatonic River would flow through here, and this is the portion of the Housatonic River that has been remediated um, in the mile and a half and half mile sections uh, that have occurred in the last decade. Um, and as you can see in this particular uh, drawing, you'll see that most of the surrounding land is completely deforested. And we've seen some other photographs of other areas, and um, there's a series of um, maps that were put together by the state of Massachusetts in the late 1800s where every community had to outline all of the areas that were deforested and from that we know about 80 percent of the entire western part of the state has been was deforested. So the next activity that that has importance to um, impacts on the river is the discovery of iron ore in um, in Connecticut and Massachusetts, and obviously the subsequent mining, and really it's the smelting that, w that we want to talk about and why that's important. Uh, this just shows a very simplified geologic diagram of the iron ore, discovered in the 1720s in northwest Connecticut, and then subsequently elsewhere in the valley in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And the importance of that is, is that um, with the discovery of the ore, the construction of blast furnaces to produce pig iron, um, for, for, the, uh, for the country at that point. And these blast furnaces were constructed all up and down the valley. Um, as many as 60 to 80 blast furnaces were operating in the 1800s from uh, Lenox all the way down into Connecticut. And this is just a, a schematic of, of what a blast furnace looks like. And basically you're putting the iron ore, limestone, and charcoal into a, a giant kiln, cooking it and pouring out the iron. Um, this just shows you an example of what one of them looks today down in Connecticut. They're still around, or, or remnants of them. And if we go back to this, so what's important about blast furnaces or iron ore? Well, it's this right here, charcoal. Um, not a lot of coal in Western Mass in Connecticut. And coal is what is used today to produce iron and steel in the blast furnaces um, around this country and many other countries in the world. Well, there's no coal. So they used wood and burned wood to produce charcoal, and the charcoal was then used to fuel the blast furnaces. You have a lot of these blast furnaces up and down the valley, they need wood. And so the forests came down, and that was a large reason for the deforestation in this area was to fuel the blast furnaces. And again, just to reiterate, when you deforest the landscape, you have increased runoff to the river, and that's what affects the river. Obviously, at the same time, you got to move all that timber. And so the river at various times and at various points was, you know, used for log runs. And when they're running logs, you got to clear areas out to make sure you can get the logs through. So there was a lot of clearing in the river going on. Um, and that affects how the river moves and operates. I'd be remiss not to show a picture of Lennox Furnace. Uh, this is a, a photo from 1875 or circa 1875. And uh, the uh, blast furnace of Lennox Furnace is right here, and I, we theorize this is the charging funnel that brought up all the coal, the uh, charcoal and everything else. But the other importance of this photo is just to reemphasize that the river was used for a lot of things. Um, it, it, it 
It was used for powering lots of industry, and so a lot of uh, industries built up on the river, and, and that has an impact on, on how the river operates. So the next industry that comes in are the paper mills. Um, the first paper mill in, you know, came in in 1801 as crane paper. Um, and in addition to the paper mills, you have a lot of woolen mills, and there's other types of mills, you know, grist mills, saw mills, uh, a whole number of uh, industries cropping up. But the importance of these, these particular, this type of industry is the, uh, the beginning of the dams, damming the rivers. Um, and as a result, many places along the river um, dams were installed or side channels were created to funnel off water for raceways to power uh, these various mills. And um, this is Woods Pond Dam today. Uh, this is an old uh, wood crib from a, a dam uh, that was uncovered back in the 1940s um, and subsequently in, in the uh, mile and a half remediation another dam similar to this was, was uncovered. So these dams had the effect of creating backwaters and, again, changing the velocity of the river, how sediment moves, and, and how it flows. Then, in the 1830s, 1850s, railroads came into town. And uh, up and down the valley, uh, railroads, uh, the railroad was installed. And this is really perhaps the, one of the more important and the most recent changes that occurred to the river. In this particular um, artist drawing um, in Lee, uh, the railroads uh, pretty much followed the course of rivers because it was a nice, easy um, uh, area to be able to put a riverbed. You didn't have to clear a lot of land. So river valleys were the natural um, choice for the construction of railroads. As a result, the railroads made a lot of changes to the river in order to get their riverbeds in place. And you'll also notice there's a fair amount of deforestation still, still present in this particular uh, diagram. So. In summary, on, on some of these changes, what were the changes? Well, there are basically three changes to the river that, that are important. The river was cleared. Material was taken out. Areas were, were um, uh, deepened. Uh, the river was dammed. And then most importantly, the river was moved and straightened. So we're going to talk more about this third bullet in the last few slides. Um, but what's some of the evidence we use to discover some of these activities. Well, we looked at a lot of older topographic maps and then yet older maps that existed for the Berkshire uh, County. And uh, we also know that, uh, you know, through the 1800s, many state legislators passed all kinds of orders and ordinances to allow local communities to make changes to the river, uh, instructing the communities to remove material, you know, to, to create side channels. And uh, we also know in the 1940s that the river was, in fact, straightened through Pittsfield um, near East Street. But the main thing that we're really interested in here is the idea of moving the river itself, actually literally picking it up and pushing it aside. And commonly done for creating farmland, um, but in the case of the Housatonic River, also very important to create a buffer for the railroad bed. And essentially, um, in this particular old topographic map um, around Woods Pond, Lenox Station, you know, the river was straightened and placed pretty much right along October Mountain um, so that the railroad had an opportunity to um, um, have a bed that was unimpacted. So what's some of the other evidence we have? Well, going back to the state legislators passing laws, this is just an example of one of those laws to, to move you know, boulders and obstructions and enlarge the channel of the river. Uh, I could not find a parallel one for the Housatonic. Um, we suspect it's there, we just haven't found it. Uh, most rivers, most state legislators were passing these laws through the 1800s. And I'm sure some of you have seen this before. It was a common practice to buy dynamite to move, your, move the river around. So uh, it was a common practice. This is what, what, what was done. So looking at some of these older topographic maps that show the evidence of where things were, were, were changed, I want to first talk about the straightening of the river in the 1940s uh, through Pittsfield. This is the 1886 topographic map. And if you, uh, this little blue wiggly line is the Housatonic River, the each branch, and pay attention to how that's uh, meandering, as we call it. And now I'm going to bring up the 1988 topographic map and you'll now see that the Housatonic River is has fewer meanders it's much it's it's more straight than it was before and 
So what would happen was, essentially these red lines just show you what they were trying to do. Essentially cut off all of these particular meanders and make it straighter. So we know that that was in fact done. Uh, that was, you know, and, and here's an example of what they were doing. Um, this is an actual photograph from the 1940s. Um, uh, this photo is actually taken from Newell Street looking south. Um, and the river, the Housatonic River Channel is right here. They're basically creating the new river channel here um, and, and dug the whole place out. And obviously, if you've been there today, it, it doesn't look anything like that. Um, but that was what was done in the 1940s. So let's look downstream from um, Pittsfield. So we'll first look at the area um, uh, just uh, downstream from the confluence in um, uh, Fred Gunner Park um, down to Holmes Road. And you'll see that there are some areas that have been straightened in here. And we know, some of the, we know many of these areas are straightened because even some older maps show a very meandering river. Um, and what we want to show with some of these particular comparisons is how the river has responded and changed since the river straightening occurred. So this is 1886. Now in 1988, the same two areas in those red boxes, straight here, and we now have uh, meandering occurring in these straight channels. And, and the importance of this when we go through these is that the, the river wants to meander. Uh, going further downstream, um, just north of New Lenox Road, uh, looking at the 1886 map. Again, we're going to look at this area here. And we're also going to look a little bit over here. And I believe it's the Joseph Drive community is right in here. But in 1944, very different. Uh, a lot of meandering has occurred. So if we compare these two areas, a very different uh, shape to the river. The river, as it flows today here, wasn't flowing that way back in the 1800s. It was much straighter, and it was actually brought along this channel here. And then going a little further south uh, to just north of Woods Pond, uh, comparing 1886 to 1988, again, this rather straighter channel, and now a much more meandering pathway and backwaters. Now, obviously, we have to recognize that Woods Pond Dam was um, was installed in the, in the late 1800s. So that obviously also had an impact in creating some of these backwaters. So in summary, we now know that uh, roughly 92% of the river from the confluence to Woods Pond had been straightened and manipulated fairly extensively uh, prior to the 1886 topographic surveys. Um, since then, we know that a little more than half of it has tried to re-meander and, and recreate new pathways for itself. And since 1944, because we have much better map coverage and air photos today than we did in the past, we know that the meanders are continuing to move. They're cutting into their banks and, and migrating, but we haven't seen the creation of any new giant meander patterns in the river. So key messages that I want you to leave you with, and it's important because some of the things I've talked about in this presentation are going to be carried forward in the, some of the following presentations this evening. Um, what we see is the river today, many portions of the river is less than 200 years old in terms of its, its, uh, uh, where it's actually flowing. Um, the remaining sections that are fairly straight are going to be prone to recreating new meanders. And in the absence of recreating new meanders, the energy that it, it's trying to um, work with can destabilize Adjacent, por adjacent portions of the river or downstream portions of the river. That energy gets channeled elsewhere in, into the system. Um, past modifications to the river, as we've seen over the last few hundred years, um, have been sub subsequently changed. And obviously what we see today, a large uh, component of what we see today, is representative of, of, of uh, reforestation just in the last 70 years. And the last point, and this is important because this really carries forward into uh, the next presentation is that rivers want to meander. It's it's their me it's the mechanism of rivers seeking equilibrium. So with that, uh, before we move to the next speaker, I just want to go over again the questions form is in in the middle of your workbook. Um, we invite you to um, jot down your questions legibly.
so that we can get them answered. Uh, so questions for Rich at this point, I think we'll, we'll move, we'll save for the panel. We have one question. Okay, don't go away, Rich. Uh, why does the old history matter now? Is that the end of the question? That's the end of the question. <laughs> um, uh, it's a good question. I, I think um, there are a number of reasons. Uh, one, obviously, looking at the, the history of the river, what's happened in the past, uh, helps us understand um, what activities have gone on and how the river has responded to those changes on a very natural level. And, and that's important in, in knowing for um, if there were activities going to occur in the future. Um, but it's also to understand how the river uh, reacts and, and how it behaves in, into various changes. Um, and it helps us understand its, uh, it, its ability to respond uh, to, to various man-made impacts. Okay, great. J just to go over again, the, que the questions are, it, I, I've been in your seat and I know it's difficult sometimes to just you know, go through 30 PowerPoints and a lot of effort went into putting these together. But a lot of the meaning comes from it when questions come up from the audience. And if you can jot those down, again, Keith or Kathy will come by collecting, collecting some questions. So I think while those are coming around, I'm, and we'll get to those, I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker. Keep things moving. Uh, Keith Bowers is the president and founder of Biohabitats, Inc. Um, Keith is... Um, Biohabitats is one of the premier firms specializing in environmental restoration, conservation, planning, and regenerative design. He's internationally recognized landscape architect who has planned, designed, and managed the construction of over 200 ecological restoration landscape architect projects. Uh, and Keith is going to help us understand a little more about what geomorphology is. And Keith, if you could explain a little bit more about your Great. education background as well. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Um, as Steve mentioned, I got a degree in landscape architecture, but I've been practicing restoration ecology for the past 29 years. I've been giving workshops and symposiums on river restoration, stream restoration, wetland restoration um, for the past uh, 15 years. And what I'm going to do tonight is talk a little bit about geomorphology and river processes. And I'm going to talk about these processes in lieu of what we just heard from Rich in terms of the history of the Housatonic River. So first, what does geomorphology mean? Well, geomorphology is the study of the evolution and configuration of landforms. So you've, if you think about geo being the earth and morphology about the shape of something, then geomorphology is about the shape of the earth and how it came to be what it is today and how processes are, in, are acting on the earth and changing our landscape. Um, there's a lot of different branches of geomorphology. There's desert geomorphology, coastal geomorphology, and what we're going to be concentrating on tonight, or at least for the next 20 some minutes, is fluvial geomorphology. Fluvial being water and how water shapes and forms the landscape. And in this particular case, um, we're going to be talking about rivers and how fluvial geomorphology shapes and forms rivers. So there's, there's really three governing processes that are really important in what we see out there in river systems. One is erosion. We all know that rivers erode. They erode, stream, they erode their river banks and they erode the river bottom. And when they erode the river banks and river bottoms, they carry sediment. And so it's really important to think of a river of just not flowing water, but flowing sediment as well. And as we get storm events, if we, as we get rain events, and those rain events um, make their way to a river, uh, we increase the level of the river, and we increase the capacity of that river to pick up sediment from the river bottom and the river banks and transport that downstream. And as we transport that sediment downstream, after that river subsides, that sediment begins to drop out and we get deposition. So these processes are really important in what we see out there in every, any river system, um, and in this particular case, the Housatonic River, in terms of its form. And wh what we want to look at is we want to look at, well, what really shapes that form? What, what interfaces with those processes of erosion, of sediment transport, and deposition? And if we look at this illustration here, we could, we could um, picture that we have changes in the land or the stream corridor, that stream in the floodplain. 
So those, those changes are, are the changes that Rich mentioned. Um, you know, we start to see changes in land cover in terms of deforestation. We see changes in land use. We see going from an agricultural situation to an urban situation. And those land, land use changes then begin to affect the runoff off the surface of that land into the river system. And in many cases, when we change land use cover like that, we're increasing the amount of runoff that makes its way to a stream system, which then elevates the water levels in the stream and elevates the amount of water being transported through the system. So then we have changes in geomorphology and hydrology. And in this case, hydrology is the amount of water that makes it to a river system. So we're seeing changes in the hydrology all the time every time we change land use. Then we see changes in stream hydraulics. And hydraulics, if you think about hydrology, is the amount of water that makes its way to a river system. Hydraulics is how that water flows through the river. Um, you get certain amounts of flows that create certain velocities or shear stresses on the stream banks and stream channels that then have the ability to pick up and move and transport sediment. So stream hydrology and stream hydraulics play an important role. And then they begin to interface with the function of the river. So if we have certain riffles and pools in the river, if we have woody debris, if we have fish habitat, when we start changing land use, we change the hydrology, we then change the hydraulics and sediment transport, and that begins to affect habitat in the river. And then those habitat changes begin to affect the specific species populations in river. So in essence, what we're doing is we're changing watershed hydrology through these river processes. We're then interfacing with stream hydraulics and that changes in rivers. The sediment transport and storage of a river begins to change. And that affects plant and animal habitat, the aquatic and riparian zones of a river. So there's three really important components of the form of a river that I want to briefly go over because they play a role in the processes of, of, of rivers. One is what we call the meander pattern. If you're looking from an airplane down on a river, you see how the re river meanders through the landscape, right? And every river has a certain meander pattern. And that meander pattern is really dictated by the slope of the land, the landscape, and by the amount of water entering that river, and by the geology, the soils, that that river interfaces with and the vegetation that the river interfaces with. And we can begin to even look at the what we call the geometry of the meander pattern and begin to give us clues about how that river meanders through the landscape. And really the meandering pattern of a river is basically that river dissipating energy over time as it flows through the landscape. Even when rivers are straightened out, in this case here, during flood events, we begin to see that meander pattern start to reform because the river is trying to dissipate that energy back out. I know I've been involved in projects where we have a concrete line channel, and during heavy high flows, the river will tend to take to jump out of that channel bank and begin to meander across the floodplain of the landscape. So all rivers want to me meander based on the amount of water, based on the soils, based on the vegetation and the landscape. Another important component of the form of the river is the, what we call the channel cross-section, or also it's referred to as the dimension. And in this case, um, there's some really important concepts to consider in river forms. One is we have what we call the base flow channel down here, and that's the channel that basically you see every day when you go out to the river, the normal flow that goes through the channel. In storm events, when we have runoff to the river system, that rises up and we get these floods that begin to happen and overtop the bank of the river onto a floodplain. And in very large flood events, very severe flood events that might only happen once every 10 years or once every 100 years, there's actually even another what we call terrace out here on the floodplain where those floods jump out onto that floodplain terrace as well. So the river is not just made up of the river channel, it's also made up of this um, what we call bankful channel here and also this floodplain channel out here. And all those are extremely important when we're talking about river processes. Another important component and the third important component is what we call channel profile and that's the slope of the river. Some rivers have a very steep slope, which you might find up in the mountains. Other rivers down in the valleys have a very gentle slope. And 
you, we can see in this illustration here that a lot of the headwater, what we call headwater streams that flow into a river might have a very steep slope and as it makes its way down the valley, the slope begins to flatten out. That also has an effect on the channel, the meander pattern of the river on steeper slopes, the straighter the meander pattern is, on flatter slopes, the more the channel begins to meander through the landscape. It also has quite an effect on the channel cross section as too. As water moves faster through a channel, it doesn't need such a wide or big cross section to handle all that water. But the slower the water moves through that channel and the more water it accumulates, then it needs a wider and larger cross section in order to handle that water. So all these are interconnected. If we change the profile of the river, um, that then changes the cross section of the river, which also changes the meander pattern of the river. If we change the meander pattern of the river, we will change the cross section or change the channel profile. So that's when, when somebody goes out and straightens a river, they cut off a meander bend, and in essence, they're actually steepening the channel grade of that river. And they begin to steepen the channel grade of that river, then water picks up speed, it creates velocity, it creates then the ability to erode the stream banks more, and then all that sediment is transported downstream and deposited downstream. So it's a, it's a process that is all interconnected. So in the river components, we have the meander pattern, the channel cross-section, the channel profile, but we also have floodplain connectivity, which is extremely important. As I mentioned in that cross-section diagram, all channels not only have a, a base flow channel and a bank flow channel, but they're all interly connected to the floodplain. Um, in this picture up here, you can see how this river has actually what we call incised or entrenched down into the landscape over time. And when it begins to flood, the flood, flood waters do not get up above those banks and up onto what was, what was historically the floodplain of this river. They stay down within the channel. So now the floodplain is now somewhere down here on this terrace right here. And if you can imagine all that energy not being able to be dissipated up on the floodplain, it's all concentrated down here and it causes increased erosion, which then, as you can imagine, uh, really interferes with the habitat of the river. Oops. Whereas if we have a river that's directly connected to the floodplain, then we have a river that when it floods, floods out onto that floodplain on a rather flatter terrace, begins to dissipate that energy. It begins to do all sorts of things from a habitat standpoint in, in, in terms of nutrient flows and hydrating that floodplain. And it's a much more stable river system. So when we talk about river stability, we can define it this way. A river is the ability of a river over time, or a stable river is the ability of a river over time in the present climate to transport the flows and sediments produced by its watershed in such a manner that the stream maintains its dimension or that cross section, its pattern, the meander pattern, and the profile, how steep the profile of the stream is, without either a grading, which means building up, or degrading, taking away over a period of time. Um, so we can think about a stable river as one that, 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 agrade, that neither agrades and, or degrades substantially over a long period of time. And this little illustration here called the Lane's Relationship is a great illustration. If you think about a river channel and you look at the amount of sediment that that river carries, whether that sediment's fine sediment or coarse sediment, you look over here at the amount of water a stream carries, and you look at the stream slope, whether it's a flatter slope or steeper slope. If we add more water to the system without changing anything else, then the pendulum begins to swing this way, and we begin to degrade the river, which means we cause erosion in the river. Whereas if all of a sudden we keep the amount of water the same, but we add more sediment to the river, the pendulum swings this way and we begin to aggrade the river or sediment begins to drop out into the channel. And that also causes instability and changes or impacts to habitat. So there's what's this called channel evolution model. And I'll briefly take you through this because I want to show you some pictures of what this looks like. But if we start out with a stable river system here, when we get those changes in the landscape that Rich was talking about, the first thing a river does is it tends to cut down in its bed in order to accommodate the ad additional amount of flows or hydrology to that system. As it begins to cut down, it also then begins to overwiden. 
and we get this sort of over widened effect because over here and here the floodplain is now down in the channel and instead of instead of accessing the floodplain up here it's trapped in here and that energy causes a lot of erosion happening in the channel till we get to a point over a long period of time where this begins to create a new channel down here and a new floodplain up on the sides here and we get this entrenched stream system um, and so we see that evolution taking place on streams when we begin to see disturbance or changes in the landscape uh, and we can see that on many of our streams especially in our urban areas and even we can see that in streams and rivers now like the Housatonic that have uh, been impacted by changes in land cover and uh, uh, uses over a long period of time. So some of the indicators of this instability, one is called incision or head cutting. If you ever thought about a, a, a gully that begins to head cut or erode its way back up slope, that happens. Um, we see channel filling, uh, entrenchment or eroding of stream banks, lateral migration is where the meanders begin to, lat to move out or inward depending on it trying to reestablish a stable meander pattern and then over widening of the channel. And some of these are just uh, pictures of some of those effects taking place and in fact on the top you can see over widening begin to happen with that channel bank. On the bottom picture here, that's basically a channel that's lost its floodplain. It's entrenching into the landscape. And as you can see, the, the amount of water in there in base flow is very little, but storm flows cause a huge problem in there and, and basically degrade or impact all the habitat in that channel. So when we talk about restoring stability in river systems, we really talk about how do we affect the channel profile, the meander pattern, and the cross section of the river to provide that stability in a river system so that all those processes are in, equal, in an equilibrium. So we can go from a condition as you see on the top to a condition you see on the bottom where we're taking those changes or those processes and working with them in such a way that we uh, affect the stability of the river. And these are some photographs. This is a river that's a graded on the top where sediment is accumulated and by removing that sediment and providing the right cross section we provide the right amount of energy to transport that sediment downstream and we don't have that problem of an aggrading stream or one filling up with sediment. On the contrary we have a stream that might be eroding um, as you can see on the outside meander bank of that and you can see the sand on the inside of the point bar there getting very very steep and typically in these meanders that point bar is a rather flat point bar we can go in there and reconnect that stream back to a floodplain and restore that equilibrium or those processes that are happening so when we talk about dynamic equilibrium what we're talking about a stream that maintains that dimension or cross section that pattern and that profile over a period of time that it, does, it doesn't aggrade or degrade over a long period of time. That doesn't mean that all streams, all streams do erode and all streams carry sediment and all streams deposit sediment, but they do it in such a way that it's all in balance. And natural streams adjust all these processes very slowly over a long period of time. And in fact, we went out and looked at the Housatonic River and did some studies out there to evaluate that stability, the stability within the Housatonic River in these processes. And we looked at specific factors that were able to give us clues as to how stable the river system is right now in terms of looking at stream banks, looking at the height of these banks that are unstable, looking at the type of vegetation that's covered on them, looking at the size of the sediment, and looking at the shape, the cross section, the profile, and the, and the pattern of the river. And this illustration or this map over to the right hand side of the slide is a map that basically shows along the Housatonic all the red spots are areas where we're seeing erosion, accelerated erosion beyond the background levels of erosion that we would typically see in a stable river system. So that we know that the land use changes that Rich has been talking about that have occurred over the last 200 years are still having an effect on the channel of the Housatonic and still the Housatonic is still responding by cutting down in the floodplain, by overwidening some areas, or by trying to create a, a new stable meander pattern in some areas. And so we can see this in, this in these two slides here. And again, it just illustrates the same thing that, that Rich was illustrating. Um, the blue represents, uh, actually in 1886, the 
the location of the river, and then the black of the river, the black area represents the existing river today, and we can see how that river has begun to readjust those meander profile or those meander patterns over a period of time. And in fact, you can even um, see that the width of the river is changing as well. So you can see that plan, that profile, um, and the uh, uh, dimension or cross section of the river begin to adjust. And that adjustment period is still happening out there for much of the, the Housatonic. And again, we, we saw that. We looked at photographs and we went back to that evolution model and said, where do, where do some of the uh, re, uh, stretches of channel actually mimic some of the, the evolution model here? And we can see the overwidening begin to happen and the incision happening in the landscape. Um, we can see in some places where we're starting to get a graded material back down where the river is actually trying to reestablish a new floodplain level. Um, and so really what we're looking at is these ongoing adjustments and in fact based on the, the studies that we did out there that the bank erosion rate is about 6,600 tons a year um, and we estimate that that's about 10 times the rate of what a stable Housatonic River would be um, based on other reference systems and based on what we could expect from a stable system. And so we're getting really areas of high bank erosion that are out of phase with the meander pattern. In other words, in a meander of a river, most of our erosion takes place on the outside of the bend. And on the inside of the bend, we get sediment deposited back down. And in some areas of the Housatonic River, not only are we getting erosion on the outside of the bend, but we're getting an awful lot of erosion on the inside of the bend too because that river is entrenching down in the landscape and there's nowhere that for the flood floods to go and so it erodes the inside of the meander bend as well. So some of those areas give us clues about the stability or instability of the, the Housatonic River. So in summary, all rivers obviously exhibit geomorphic processes. Um, they all have not only the processes of hydrology, hydraulics, sediment transport, sediment deposition, um, but it, you know, nutrient cycling and, and habitat as well. The dimension, pattern, and profile are all really important components of a river system. And when we begin to affect one of those components, the other two um, respond to that. And they have uh, uh, impacts as well. Floodplain connectivity is extremely important in river systems. That once we take away the floodplain from a river, then we enter into sort of this downward spiral until that river goes through that evolution model and is again allowed to create a new floodplain down within the old entrenched channel. And then the concept of dynamic equilibrium is really important in rivers. All rivers are dynamic. They all erode. They all they all transport sediment, they all deposit sediment, but again, they do that very slowly over a very long period of time, and that's called dynamic equilibrium. And when we have a channel that's not stable, then it loses that, that, that um, ability to, be, uh, uh, to, to have that equilibrium state. So those are all some things that we need to consider when we start looking at the Housatonic River um, and the potential for the Housatonic River. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, there, there are a number of questions that came up that uh, are probably more appropriate for the panel, so we're going to get to those questions, but they're sort of cross-reaching cross the different disciplines that you're, you're hearing to, uh, at the start. But I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask you, Keith, sure. from the community. Um, could you explain, actually, this may have been in Rich's statement. Rich, you could come back let, you know, at the end as the panel, but Keith, I think Keith could 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 hit this too. Could you explain the statement, much of what we see today is the result of reforestation in the last 70 plus years? Well, reforestation is certainly helping in terms of changing, again, changing the hydrology of the river system. So as we begin to reforest the landscape, more water is captured in those areas and infiltrated into the soil and taken up by trees and less less of that stormwater is making its way to the river system. So over a period of time, what we've seen is in deforestation, more water is making, making its way to the river. The river adjusts accordingly to handle that additional water. And as we begin to reforest the landscape, we again change the land cover again, and maybe less water is making its way to the system. But we also have to keep that in balance with urbanization and putting down impervious surfaces and how much water is making it to the river from these impervious surfaces as well. 
and how does the history of the river and the man-made changes to it and its, rea and its reaction to these changes inform your remediation decision? Hmm. <laughs> um, well, I think that if any remediation were to be done and restoration would, were, were to be contemplated after that remediation, then we would need to take a look at, again, those processes that are acting on the river system. Where we, we need to look at the hydrology, the hydraulics, and the sediment transport. And we need to take into account the changes that have occurred in the past and what changes we might see in the future. And as we begin to think about the possibility of restoring the Housatonic River, we can take those, we can take those processes and build it into a restoration concept. And, and also, I think Thursday night might address that a little yep. further. Thursday night will address that further. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so why is dis dis disturbance to a stream corridor typically results in an increasingly negative spiral of degradation? Why not some changes or disturbances result in positive effects? Um, I, I guess uh, if, the, if the changes or disturbances were done in such a way that they would allow that stream or river to reach, to either stay in a dynamic equilibrium or reach a dynamic equilibrium rather quickly, then those changes could be positive to the river. But again, once we change the hydrology, the amount of water going to the river, once we affect the hydraulics, the way the water moves through the system, and once we change the amount of sediment that's moved through the river, then that all has profound effects on the river system. There's been some studies by uh, um, uh, nonprofit organizations. One, the Center for Watershed Protection did a study about 20 years ago, and I think found that any watershed that has uh, a degree of more than 10 to 12 percent impervious surface within the watershed begins to drastically change those processes within a river system. Okay, thank you. And can you anticipate how the river will change in the future? That's hard to do. Um, it's a crystal ball, but what we can we can anticipate a couple of things. One, we can project out based on what we've seen in the past, land use changes, potential zoning, potential growth opportunities, and looking at best management practices for the future in terms of stormwater management and reforestation, how those, again, how that may affect the hydrology and hydraulics of a river channel. So there are ways of modeling what we might be able to, what we envision might happen in the future. Um, and we also have to take into, into account things like climate change, um, how that might affect uh, weather patterns, and, and how that will, again, affect the hydrology and hy hy hydraulics of the river system. Lane's equation relevant to dredging and impact. Sure. So um, if we look at Lane's equation, then again, if we change the sediment supply to the river, we change the amount of sediment that's either making its way into the river or we starve the river of sediment, um, or we change the sediment size of the river. So if you imagine a certain flow of water being able to move a certain particle size of sediment, and then all of a sudden you change that to a larger particle size and that same amount of water can't move that sediment, then all of those are gonna have effects on the, the um, processes of the river channel. And the idea behind looking at potential remediation opportunities or potential restoration opportunities is that, again, we would look at the balance between the hydrology and the hydraulics and the sediment size in order to map out a scenario where potential remediation or potential restoration could take place that would create a dynamic equilibrium in the channel. Thank you. What is the time it takes for a PCB-laden silt sediment to move a mile? And what is the biggest influence on flow of sediment? Right, so I think we're going to get into that either at the last presentation today or certainly tomorrow night, that, that question we can answer. I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. More of a modeling question? Yes. 
One last question. Is the river cleanup that has taken place in Pittsfield affecting the stability of the Housatonic River below the confluence? I think, again, any time you change those dynamics of the river system, you're going to affect downstream and upstream of the river system. And so that's why I think it's important that any future changes in the river system take that into account. Right. We're, we're going to take a, a very short break. Thank you, Keith. Uh, I'd like to um, next introduce uh, John Lord Lordy. John's going to speak in, be speaking on ecological characterization. John is uh, a professional wetland scientist, certified wildlife biologist, an accomplished botanist, and experienced ecological risk assessor. He's directed numerous projects involving complex environmental regulations at hazardous waste sites and marine facilities, and has taught courses at international environmental conferences on ecological risk assessment protocols. John, thank you. Thank you, Steve. And I will be selling CDs afterwards. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I, I uh, want to open up just by talking, what is ecological characterization? And our, our charge when we started the project in 1998 was to provide a foundation for understanding um, what plants and animals uh, occur in the area, as well as some reference areas, and then to start to tease apart um, any relationships we may find, both from uh, natural disturbances, some of the disturbances that uh, uh, Keith and Rich talked about, as well as any potential influences from um, elevated levels of different contaminants. So that's essentially our, our first job. We came in and we just did a macroscopic to a microscopic view and we tried to um, identify all the different components of the ecosystem. I'm going to walk you through that. So one of the foundations of a ecological characterization is identifying the natural communities that occur in your study area. That's a, a reoccurring assemblage of plants, animals, and the habitat that they live in. Um, and that, that's really, uh, if you look at the, uh, what was that movie about the baseball team, if you build it they will come. Same is true a lot with animal communities. Each animal has a specific habitat or several habitats that they occur in. If they uh, typically are found in the home range where that habitat is, they have a high likelihood of being present. So that's kind of where we start out from a macroscopic uh, standpoint. And, and again, it's, a, it's one of the foundations of, of a, the beginning of an ecological characterization is identifying the habitats and then putting together a list of all the animals that you would expect to see in those habitats, and that's what we call an animal habitat association. Uh, we, a lot of the references uh, to uh, the talks you're seeing uh, tonight and, and in subsequent nights are going to talk about the primary study area. That's the area from the confluence of the east and west, west branch of the Housatonic in Pittsfield down to the Woods Pond Dam. Uh, we also looked at the entire river all the way down to, uh, to Long Island Sound. Um, and did ecological characterization as well. Much of what we're going to talk about today is going to focus on the upper parts, but um, a lot of the work exists for the rest of the uh, rest of the river. Um, we found 18 natural communities uh, in the primary study area, or PSA. Uh, we had seven additional natural communities in reference areas. Um, when we identified all the communities in, in the primary study area, we also looked for reference areas that were um, places nearby to this location that had the same type of habitat um, but were, were basically as similar as possible to what we had here but did not have the elevated levels of PCBs. So that was one thing we were looking for to see is there apparent differences between those areas. Um, the communities that we saw in the uh, PSA, uh, one lacustrine which is a lake related or a ponded habitat, uh, that's essentially Woods Pond three different riverine communities, uh, primary difference being the flow regime in those communities, nine palustrine or freshwater communities, those are freshwater wetlands, and then five different types of terrestrial communities or upland communities. Um, the, the primary ones are low gradient stream, uh, shrub swamp, and, and transitional uh, floodplain forest. Um, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning of my talk that I, I did want to mention is that uh, besides uh, the group of scientists that I work directly for or with, um, 
there's been a tremendous amount of work done uh, by GE, uh, GE's consultants, uh, the state of uh, Connecticut, the state of Massachusetts, and a whole host of consultants that they also hired. Um, there is, uh, I think, the most robust set of data for this project site um, of any data set for any project I've worked on uh, since 1981. So we have a good uh, base of, of information, I, and I do want to give credit to uh, all the good uh, scientists that have contributed to that work over time. So what do you do when you map the natural communities? Well, you, the first thing you do is you put together a set of maps uh, showing the location, uh, the extent of those natural communities in, in the area of interest. And it gives you also a, a, a comparison to um, the juxtaposition of the communities, both to one another um, as well as to things like developed infrastructure and, although, and also uh, areas of um, undeveloped habitat. We also put together some representative cross sections that kind of illustrate how those communities are related to uh, the elevation of the river and the floodplain. Again, uh, Rich and Keith both presented information on the uh, hydrodynamics and the hydraulics of the river system. A lot of that was related to uh, both the river itself and when it goes out of bank. And um, we wanted to be able to relate the commu natural communities as they occur to the river system uh, in a cross-section manner. So we prepared a number of those in representative areas. Um, I'm going to move now to talking about some of the different species or groups of species that we, uh, that we looked at. Uh, again, I'm covering um, uh, over a decade worth of material in, in a 20-minute uh, talk, so I'm going to move pretty quickly. But first group is rare species, and there are different definitions of what makes something rare. Um, we, we used multiple levels. The first level we used was a global level. Uh, Nature Conservancy is probably the best uh, uh, repository of information on species as they occur on a global level. We looked to see what the ratings were for the species of interest in this project area. Um, and use their global ratings. The next was the federal level, species regulated under the Federal Endangered Species Act. We looked to see which of those uh, had designations and occurred here. And then also um, on the state level, we looked at species that, had, uh, that were regulated under the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act. Um, species are ranked according to the rarity, basically, and, and rarity and vulnerability. You know, how often do they occur? How uh, vulnerable are the populations to extirpation? Uh, and it applies both to, uh, to plants and to animals. Um, and, and many of these species can be good indicators uh, of uh, how natural an environment is, or in some cases, how resilient an environment is. Um, I'll give a couple examples. Some rare species um, are dependent on disturbance. Um, Iliacris intermedia that occurs in the river here. It's an annual plant. It grows on uh, the bars that form um, in the river. It's dependent on having those bars form and being in a disturbed environment. Uh, other species like Cavex grayei, which occurs in the high floodplain, I'm sure you're all familiar with that sedge. Uh, it occurs in uh, uh, forested floodplains with a, a moist environment and really rich soils. Um, and it's not, you don't see it in a lot of places. So you know, there's a lot of variability. Um, some, of the, some species are more resilient to impacts. Uh, species I spent a lot of time with working on uh, two species, Cavex polymorpha and uh, Scirpus longii, uh, were both dependent on different types of disturbances. And if they weren't disturbed, the populations would be uh, extirpated. Um, we, we put all the information on the rare species together in a, in a pretty detailed report, which has been uh, supplemented um, both by work that uh, GE's consultants did and also that the Mass Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program uh, prepared. Um, and obviously, the presence of rare, threatened, endangered species will have uh, important considerations if uh, when any remedial alternative is chosen. Uh, next group I want to move into is invertebrates, um, animals without backbones. And the uh, first group was the aquatic invertebrates. We, we studied quite a bit um, in the river. Uh, uh, they're an important part of the food chain. We also looked at some uh, terrestrial invertebrates as well. We targeted a couple different groups for different things. Um, one one uh, group that we targeted in both the aquatic environment and the terrestrial environment 
um, were invertebrates that had a likelihood of bioaccumulating PCBs. We wanted to collect them and do tissue analysis to see what the levels were, uh, both to see if there's effects to those individuals or to use those tissue levels and food chain modeling that was part of the ecological risk assessment. Um, we also looked at uh, different metrics like looking at aquatic invertebrates that occurred in the river. There's metrics that have been developed uh, over time looking at the number of different species that occur, um, the, the species tolerance to different types of uh, uh, pollution, and there's indexes that have been developed over time. So that, that type of data was also collected. Uh, freshwater mussels, one group of invertebrates we looked at, uh, we found some in the river. We found one uh, species that's listed as a special concern, the triangle floater. Uh, numbers of mussels were lower than we expected to find. Um, after we worked in the river a while, we noticed that there was significant um, transport of sediment during certain storm events. Um, in fact, we originally had a caged mussel study that was going on, and the cages were buried under sand after one storm event. So if you're a mussel which doesn't move very fast, um, if the sediment's moving fast, you can easily get buried. So much of the habitat uh, isn't great muscle habitat because of that. And in, and in fact, where they do occur uh, is where you have uh, uh, beds that um, are naturally scoured and don't have significant deposits because of the transport of sediment in those areas. We also did dragonfly surveys, uh, primarily because a number of dragonflies are now on the state um, threatened endangered species list. Uh, we found two endangered species, one threatened. Uh, the state has subsequently found a couple more species that occur there. Um, we also did some aquatic funnel trapping and collected uh, dip net surveys for invertebrates that occurred in the vernal pools. We did a number of fish surveys which uh, supplemented a database that um, has been accumulating for some time. Uh, both State of Mass, State of Connecticut, uh, and uh, GE have been conducting surveys for quite a bit of time. Um, we uh, conducted additional surveys. Uh, we wanted to get a handle on all the species that were present, um, describe both the, uh, yeah, everything from the minnows up to the larger predators like the pike. Um, we wanted to identify fish that were um, being eaten by both uh, fish-eating birds and fish-eating mammals, and we wanted to collect tissue samples from them to understand what the concentrations were in their tissue and subsequently to uh, model what the exposure would be to uh, different receptors. Um, obviously fish are a very important recreational uh, resource in the river, uh, both uh, during the growing season and, and during the winter, uh, and the fishery resource is uh, pretty significant because of that. Uh, based on the literature work that we did, uh, we came up with a list of 41 species we expected to find in the river. Um, we identified 25 of those uh, 41 in the river, um, and uh, most of the fish that we identified, actually all of them, were in, in habitats that we expected to find them in. Um, we had some pretty good, we were able to develop some pretty good correlations between the habitat in the river and the species, fish species assemblage. Um, you know, white suckers, largemouth bass, yellow perch, bluegills, and uh, carp were the most common one. Um, carp, goldfish, uh, rainbow trout, and brown trout are examples of some of the uh, um, introduced species that occur in the river. Uh, one thing we did not find in uh, the area, uh, we didn't find any bright old shiners, we didn't find any uh, long-nosed suckers. Those are two of the endangered species we were looking to see if they occurred um, in, the, in the primary study area. Uh, we looked at uh, reptiles and amphibians as well. Uh, they can be really good indicators of environmental quality. Uh, we surveyed uh, 68 pools, both temporary or vernal pools as well as permanent uh, pools in the area, both looking to see um, you know, the number of different species that these pools uh, provided habitat for and then also to see the frequency occurrence of different species. Uh, as far as reptiles go, we saw five different reptile species, uh, garter snake, northern water snake, which are, are, those are pretty neat. I don't know if any of you ever caught those. I remember as a kid I used to catch them and bring them home and my mother would freak out. Uh, 
So I used to bring home snapping turtles for that matter as well. Um, we did find, uh, and, and wood turtles were known to occur in the river. Uh, we have subsequently uh, observed them uh, on a number of occasions, and they're a species of reptile that does occur in a good stretch of the river, both in the primary study area and then outside of it. Um, we observed a number of, uh, of amphibians uh, in the vernal pools, both species that are considered to be obligate vernal pool species like the wood frog and spotted salamander, as well as uh, species like the green frog and the bullfrog and the leopard frog. Um, actually, the bullfrog is a good example of uh, an invasive amphibian. Uh, it's pretty ubiquitous throughout the, uh, throughout the entire area. Uh, we did observe two salamander species of special concern, the Jefferson salamander and the four-toed salamander. Okay, moving on to birds. Um, obviously, uh, this is a really rich area uh, for birds. It's a great birding spot. Canoe Meadows is a, a really nice local resource to have the Audubon Sanctuary. Um, and it's, uh, the, the bird life here is pretty fantastic if, if you're a birder. Um, you got everything from, you know, eagles and osprey down to uh, some pretty neat warblers that um, only occur in a few areas. You also have bitterns here and a number of species I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, some of these species in the literature are shown to be more susceptible to PCBs than others, so they were species that so a few of them we focused on in the ecological risk assessment. Um, and we wanted to identify which of any of them were going to potentially be susceptible to the effects of PCBs. Uh, for wading birds, we, we documented five species of wading birds, uh, Virginia rail, soar rail, green backed heron, great blue heron, and common moorhen. Um, common moorhen is an example of a species that's um, using habitat that is man-made. It's, a, again, a, a rare species, but it's found in the backwaters and the ponded areas down by Woods Pond. Um, those habitats are a result of the Woods Pond Dam backing up the water. Um, we identified 47 different species of uh, forest birds. Uh, three species of waterfowl that were breeding there, mallards, wood ducks, and Canada geese. Um, and again, we uh, identified several nesting pairs of, uh, of kingfisher. Uh, we did uh, hawk and owl surveys. We used uh, playback calls for them. Uh, pretty, so it's a pretty uh, cool way to sample birds. You essentially play back the ca uh, call uh, from another hawk or an owl. If there's a territorial pair, they will respond to it. It's a pretty nice way to survey. And it, it can be a lot of fun because the birds will come right at you. Um, and, and we found, I'm not going to read through the, uh, the long list, but um, uh, both in the primary study area in the, re in the reference area, we, we observed the hawks and owls we expected to see there. Uh, some of the rare bird species I've mentioned, I'll just reiterate, American bittern, there's some great bittern habitat, primarily south of New Lenox Road. Uh, bald eagles, they haven't uh, um, nested here. They attempted to nest here a number of years ago down by Woods Pond. Uh, the tree, uh, the nest blew over and they have not subsequently um, attempted to nest. Uh, Northern Harrier, sharp shinned hawk, common moorhen I mentioned, and the two warbler species are, are just transients that we saw during migration. And the last group I'm going to talk about are mammals. Um, we wanted to obviously identify the species that were commonly occurring here, identify which ones we wanted to evaluate during the risk assessment. Uh, certain species are known to be more susceptible to PCBs than others, and we wanted to focus in on them. Uh, so we did a number of different types of surveys. Uh, mink and otter studies were one that we focused on because of their known susceptibility to PCBs. Um, we did snow tracking scent post surveys, um, and otter scat analysis when we found it. Um, and that, what, what that is essentially, um, when we did find uh, a few otter scat as otter poop, uh, yeah, you find it, you, we dried it out, we, identif we were able to identify different prey items, and for the fish, we were able to identify what species of fish and also the age class, and then we could correlate um, the species and the size or uh, age class to what we found during our fishery surveys, so we were able to estimate the PCB load and then estimate what would be in the otter's diet. Did a lot of small mammal work. We did as, uh, as well as uh, GE, um, looked at catch per unit effort um, as well as species diversity. Um, and then we did bat surveys. We, 
Um, those of you who have canoed on the uh, river at night know that there's a lot of bats go into the or fly above the river and feed on aquatic insects as they're emerging right at dusk. Um, so we uh, d uh, use these anabat detectors which essentially take the low frequency sound of a bat, um, put it into a computer program, they slow it down and then you get a sonogram and you're able to determine what species are, are present. And uh, we, again, with our species habitat association, we estimated there were going to be 52 species potentially occurring. We uh, observed 42, which is pretty good. A uh, number of common species, uh, I'm not going to go through that list. Uh, some interesting sightings, I mean, bears um, use the area pretty frequently. Isabella, who's here, I remember she had never uh, seen a bear, and we were doing small mammal trapping one day, and she goes, hey, can I go with you? And I'm like, yeah, well, there's been a bear hanging around. And, we were using peanut butter to bait the traps, and sure enough, we went out to check the traps, and there was a, a saw with two cubs, and that was pretty funny, so we got to see her pretty close. Um, and there's a bobcat that are, are frequently here, and I, I'm not sure if, if many people have seen them, but uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, you don't get to see them all too frequently, and they're, they're around. Um, the rare species, uh, water shoe were an interesting uh, find. Uh, Small-footed myotis were another interesting find. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's about it for mammals. There's a, a, a summary list of the, uh, of the rare animals we observed, um, and the ratings are based on the, uh, the Mass Endangered Species Act um, list. I'm not, again, I'm not going to read the whole list, but this will be in the presentation that's posted. Uh, just a few summary points. Uh, it, you know, a, as you've heard in the previous talks, it, definitely a really interesting area. Um, I, I think when we all dug into looking at some of the historical changes that have occurred on a landscape level here, we're a little bit surprised, but similar to other places in New England where um, early practices from clearing, uh, farming, um, and then use of the river for various activities has really influenced what's on the river, um, what's on the river now and what was on the river the last couple hundred years. Uh, you know, pretty, what I would consider to be extensive alterations of the floodplain. Um, and some of the adjacent areas. Uh, and it also, it kind of shows the resilience of some of these systems. Um, and a lot of, the, a lot of the, uh, the forests come back, and it's interesting, as an ecologist, I won't digress too long, because I think I'm out of time, but traveling around to different parts of, well, of the US and North America, and you appreciate a couple things when you're in New England. Number one, we have an abundant supply of precipitation. Um, we also have uh, moderately fertile to, to fertile soils. In, in the Marble Valley here, you have uh, above average fertile soils. And it gives us really good, robust vegetation. And in a lot of places, you don't have that. And that, that it translates into a higher diversity of species assemblages. Uh, one thing I mentioned, there were, uh, as has been um, pointed out, a number of rare, threatened, endangered species. Um, I want to mention they were, they, they were infrequently as observed, and they were observed in discrete areas. Um, they definitely occur uh, in the area, but um, we, I didn't go into great detail about the predominance of invasive species or um, some of the work that these guys presented on, on the large alteration that's occurred. So we have the species present. Um, our findings indicate uh, we're actually for each occurrence, we filled out pretty detailed forms, described exactly where they were. So. You know, they were infrequently observed and in, observed in discrete areas. Um, and the invasive species uh, I issue is, uh, I it's interesting looking at this system <coughs> in comparison to a lot of others. Pretty similar, a lot of species that are in the floodplain that travel by um, flood transport. Purple loosestrife is a good example when it gets into an aquatic system. Um, it's fairly pervasive in some areas. Uh, other species like garlic mustard, which is in the high floodplain, fairly prevalent. So we have a, a, what I call a kind of a dichotomous system. We have some really neat areas. We've got the place like the Burr Oak Forest just northwest of, uh, of Woods Pond, which has been cut over, but it's a nice intact and one of the better examples of that forest I've ever seen. Then we have other areas that um, have been significantly altered in the past, and they're not great examples of natural communities, and they're in many ways full of invasive species. So uh, there's a lot going on in the system. And with that, I think I'll shut up. Not yet. Oh. Don't shut up yet. We, there are a couple of questions for you, John. Uh, what happens to the plants and animals during a flood? <laughs> 
Well, it depends on the species. Um, I'll, I'll start out with some of the, uh, uh, the trees. Things like silver maple and red maple um, are adapted to uh, being inundated by floodwaters uh, for weeks at a time during the growing season. So those species, they don't do much, they just hang out. Um, other species that are in the floodplain, um, uh, short-tailed shrews, for example, uh, they will either move out of the area um, or they will get covered with flood water and die. So, and it, it, it's small mammal populations are a good example of a species that um, some species are adapted for that, particularly ones that live in the in the floodplain. And also, a lot of our small mammal populations can quickly repopulate following a major event like that. Okay. Uh, uh, what what is the status of the fringed polygala? Uh, it's pretty common. It's, it's one of our common flowering spring plants. It's a nice little orchid that we have. Um, it doesn't have any special status because it's, uh, it's actually common. Okay. Yeah. And what about population data for birds and mammals? Did you find numbers that could be classified as normal, especially fish eaters? Well, there's only a few that we were, again, we, you, you have a whole host of animals that occur in this area. There's only a few that we actually did more in-depth studies on. Mink and otter were ones that we, as well as uh, General Electric, did um, more in-depth studies on. Um, uh, EPA's results indicate that the prevalence of mink and otter in the primary study area is much lower than found in similar reference areas. So it sounds like, next question, so, <laughs> sounds like bats of, of rare species in the river. So, and I'm sorry, it sounds like lots of rare species in the river. So the river, okay, and better to leave alone? Well, that's an interesting question. There's a, there's a multi-facets to that. First, I'm not sure I'd characterize it as there being lots of rare species in the river itself. I'm not sure if they're talking about the river and the floodplain. So, uh, there certainly is a high occurrence of rare species in this area. Um, there's a pretty high occurrence of rare species documented in the floodplain. Um, the rare species that occur in the riverine environment are uh, obviously the wood turtle and uh, uh, the Iliacris intermedia. Um, those species, you know, Iliacris intermedia is adapted to disturbance, depending on, you know, if anything's ever done, um, it's a species that, in all likelihood, would be easy to restore. Wood turtles, you'd have to look at the metapopulation. There's wood turtles above this, um, there's wood turtle populations adjacent to it, and wood turtle populations downstream. Um, some of the potential effects are, uh, on that population would depend on how much of an impact there is, how wide scale it is, and how much likelihood there is for those adjacent populations to come back in. So it's a complex issue, and it's not, it's not something easily answered right away. Um, we have been in discussions, I know, um, with uh, Mass uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife talking about this with a number of different species, just to see, and a lot of it depends on whether the entire area is done, or if nothing's done, or if there's a surgical amount of uh, corrective measure done. So there's a lot of variability. Even with the presence of PCBs, there seems to be a very rich and thriving wildlife. How much, how much are there PCBs causing, and is this stress decreasing over time now that no new sources of PCBs exist and existing PCBs are being buried naturally? Can we go that again? Or you well, I think I have the gist of it. A, a couple things. One is that issue is going to be addressed in much greater detail the next couple nights. Um, yeah. If you read the peer-reviewed ecological risk assessment and start going through each of the different uh, taxa that were studied, everything from the invertebrates, um, the invertebrates that were found to be uh, significant impacts to some of the species that were studied. If you look at the fish, Don Tillett found that there were impacts to the fish. On a population level, though, you look and the fish community um, is, I don't know, there's abundant uh, 
bass in the river, for example. So you have to wonder if some of the stuff that's going on in the Hudson's going on here. Um, but we know on an individual level there were effects. You look at the mink and otter, as I previously mentioned, uh, yeah, our data certainly indicates that there's much fewer numbers of those two species using this area than were found in reference areas. We know they're susceptible to PCBs. So um, there, if you look at the risk assessment, uh, there definitely are effects. The, the problem is, is that if you look, if you're an average person going out to the river, even not an average person, a trained wildlife biologist, and you look and you don't start digging into the details about both some of the um, impacts that man has had historically that, that these guys presented previously, and you don't dig into the risk assessment and look at what's been done, it can appear to the naked eye that everything's fine, when in fact that's not the case. So, you know, again, it's like everything else, it's hard to give a quick sound bite to something and, and do it justice, but um, there's pretty significant amount of information in the public record right now that, that really addresses that. Uh, John, have you studied wildlife in the first two miles after the remediation and have species returned? Yes. Um, the best work that was done was with the invertebrates, and I believe Dick McGrath has presented this, or Scott Campbell has presented it previously. Um, and the uh, looked at the species assemblage that was present there and the tissue levels, and I can't remember the exact amount of decrease in tissue levels, but it was a very significant amount. And subsequent, uh, subsequently, the species diversity and abundance increased as well. So when following the remedial action for the insects in that section of the river, there was a good improvement. What is the likelihood of endangered species returning after its habitat has been destroyed and then restored? That's sort of the same Yeah, it, it varies a lot per species, and it depends on the the size and the extent of alteration that occurs. It depends on whether there's, um, you know, a population that is nearby and adjacent that can naturally repopulate it. Um, you know, there's a, there's a whole host of things. And I think that's the thing that, that's the tough part of the equation that we're getting at is if you go in and you do a massive, you know, uh, removal and don't do a good restoration, well, you can pretty much uh, guarantee that you're not going to have great success. If you do a more focused removal and do a great restoration plan, um, you have a much higher likelihood of success. But it varies per species and it's a complex question to answer. And, and a follow-up to that is can you cite examples of where endangered species have returned after major disturbances and restoration? Yes. Um, yeah, I gave an example earlier of Carex polymorph. That's probably a species I'm more familiar with. Uh, we've had some sites we've gone in and uh, done some mass re mass removals and transpl transpl uh, transplantation. Easy for me to say. Um, and that species, which is adapted to disturbance, did quite well. Um, uh, Calistigia spimantha, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. I'm trying to think of the the uh, common name. It's a type of it's upright bindweed. Um, Another species we worked with, it was not a contaminated site, but it was another, from a disturbance, site, uh, disturbance standpoint, it's another good example. A um, uh, shopping mall was going in, they wiped out the habitat, but we went in, took the plants, transplanted them, and they're doing fine. But again, that species was adapted to uh, disturbance, so it was, it was easier to do. But yeah, it was successful. Any explanation why no common or hooded mergansers? Aren't they fish eaters? Oh, there's uh, hooded mergansers here. Um, and we, uh, this, uh, we've seen hooded mergansers during the, uh, absolutely during migration. And one of the wood duck nests that we checked actually had hooded merganser eggs in it, but it was a dump nest, right? I'm not, sh I don't know if I need to go into that detail, but some wood, wood ducks um, will sometimes use nest boxes as a dump nest. So females will just lay multiple eggs there and never tend to them. Um, so we did find eggs there, but we didn't consider them to be successful uh, nesters. Uh, common mergansers use the river during the winter, and we have observed them there. Okay, just a couple more. Uh, results of tissue samples um, do they do they equal that there are PCBs in the tissue samples? Now I understand this could get addressed again a little more depth tomorrow. But from your perspective and the work which, you've done, which species? 
I, 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 almost every group of species we sampled, uh, starting from the paraphyton, which is a, essentially a, an assemblage of um, uh, el algae and other material that grows on the rocks and on the vegetation, has PCBs. The insects have PCBs. The fish have the PCBs. All the mammals mm -hmm. we studied. Uh, the, the waterfowl tissue that we sampled had some of the highest levels of PCBs ever recorded. We en ended up, I think they put a, uh, a recommendation on the flyway about eating the, the wood ducks because of the, the samples we collected there. So there's absolutely tissue accumulation. Okay. There are a couple more questions I think we'll get to with the, the full panel. Thank you, John. Uh, I wanted to uh, introduce our, our last presenter uh, for the evening, and Dick McGrath, who's a principal and co-owner of the Isosceles Group in Boston. Dick is an aquatic ecologist with 40 years experience conducting and managing research in oceans, estuaries, and rivers. He's been the technical director for the Rest of the River Investigation for the last 10 years, and for two years prior to that was the quality assurance manager. Dick, thank you. This is a tough subject, um, and uh, I, I know you're going to lighten it up for this, this audience as best you can. I'd just uh, like to start by thanking you all for coming out tonight. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, I know that the calendar says it's spring. The weatherman has other ideas. It's kind of nasty out there. So thank you, and uh, I really appreciate your time. The talks so far this evening have focused on characteristics really that are common to, to all rivers, with the exception of some of the last discussion, we really have been looking so far at things that are common to all rivers. All rivers have a history, obviously, although most of them don't have as rich a history as the Housatonic. All rivers are subject to the same laws of physics, and so they have the same geomorphological processes that dictate how they behave. And all rivers support, to some extent, uh, wildlife, plants and animals uh, in the river and on the floodplain. We now turn to uh, something that is not characteristic of all rivers, fortunately, uh, and that is PCBs. And what I'd like to do this evening is take the next 15 minutes or so and go over with you some of the characteristics of PCBs, a little bit of PCB chemistry, which I, I hope won't be too painful, uh, talk a little bit about the biogeochemistry of PCBs, how they behave once they enter the environment, and then talk about the toxicity of PCBs. Now, you're going to hear a lot more about all of these things tomorrow night and through the rest of the, uh, the program. But tonight, I'd just like to set the stage, uh, give you some of the, the basic concepts so that you'll be more prepared uh, when you come back tomorrow, and I hope you will be coming back tomorrow, uh, to hear some of the more detailed presentations. Just a quick overview on PCBs. I think many of you are aware that the, the term PCB is an acronym for polychlorinated biphenyl. We'll talk in a moment about what a biphenyl is. Chlorinated means that there are chlorine atoms attached to that biphenyl. And poly is a Greek prefix meaning many. Now, many in this case uh, might mean only one. But as you'll see, it can also mean up to 10 chlorines on the biphenyl basic structure. PCBs are man-made chemicals. They do not exist in the environment. You may see a term uh, xenobiotic, foreign to life or foreign to living things. They're totally man-made. They did not exist until the 1800s when they were first synthesized. They are uh, chemicals that have many uh, industrial uses. They uh, are part of many products and processes. They have unique properties. Uh, they are oils. They are non-flammable and they don't degrade. And uh, those three characteristics alone were enough uh, so that they were used in many, many different types of products over the years. But they were particularly useful, and, and that's, of course, why we're here all, uh, all here tonight. They were particularly useful for cooling and insulating electrical components, transformers, capacitors, things like that. When they were initially uh, Synthesized, the, the feeling was that because they were, uh, they did not break down, they, they were uh, not biodegraded, uh, 
that uh, they probably were inert and, and had no toxic effects, but it very quickly became apparent that they did create environmental and health risks. As a result, in 1976, uh, with the Toxic Substances Control Act, TOSCA as it's referred to, EPA was given the authority to regulate PCBs, which they did very quickly. 1977, it became apparent to the major manufacturer of PCBs in, in uh, this country, Monsanto Company, that they were going to be banned, so they stopped manufacturing PCBs in 1977, and subsequently manufacturing of PCBs was banned in 1979. The characteristic of PCBs that brings us here tonight is that they are persistent. Most of the PCBs that have been released to the environment, not just here, but in other rivers and other places, uh, remain there today. I've got just a couple, if I can find the pointer, a couple of, of uses of, of PCBs that may be of interest that you may not be aware of. Uh, this is uh, no carbon paper. Uh, PCBs were used as the vehicle for the pigments in the no carbon paper. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Fox River in Wisconsin, and it was the manufacture and recycling of this no-carbon paper that led to the PCB contamination of the Fox River. Uh, PCBs are used in caulking compounds quite frequently. They, are also, they also appear in the ballast of uh, fluorescent light fixtures. And then, of course, as, as we know, in transformers uh, and other types of electrical components. Now. Here comes the fun part. I'd like to take you back to those wonderful days of high school chemistry for a few minutes, or college chemistry. PCBs are molecules, and I think we know that, and they're composed of carbon, hydrogen, and chlorine atoms. Uh, the carbon atoms are the ones that form the structure of the PCB. Carbon atoms have four bonds, and they can join with each other, or they can join with other chemicals. Now, I've depicted a ring structure up here, uh, the C's are the carbon atoms, and as you can see, there are six of them in a ring, and each of them is attached, or has attached, a hydrogen atom. If you count the bonds here, we have one, two, three on each of the carbons, and then we've got this ring here in the middle, and we don't necessarily need to get into the physical chemistry of it, but what the ring means is that there's another bond here that, in effect, circulates around and becomes a fourth bond for all of these carbon atoms. So. If we just go around the ring, we can see we've got one, two, three, and then the, the ring in the middle accounts for the fourth. This is actually the, the chemical that we know as benzene. Now, if you take two of these six carbon rings and you join them together, you get the structure that's known as biphenyl. And I've depicted that down here at the bottom. Now, we've left out the carbons of the C's, and the, they're implied in each of these intersections. And also, we've left out the H's, but if there's nothing else there, that's implied as well. So every time you see this kind of angle, that means that there's a carbon atom with a hydrogen atom attached to it. Now here, I've depicted an example of a polychlorinated biphenyl, a PCB. This particular one has three chlorine atoms attached. Now, if you can imagine, you can have one chlorine atom on each of these carbons, so you can have one chlorine in each position, so you can have up to 10 chlorines, and they can be in different configurations. So there's a lot of different ways that you can build a PCB molecule. And I thought as a group exercise, we could go through and take a look at a couple of structures and see if these are, in fact, different PCBs. So I won't take a lot of time with this, but the question is, is this PCB different from that PCB? All right, and I can see. Charlie's got it. He's saying no, right? If I were to walk around, I guess I can walk around with this microphone. If I walk around behind the back of the screen, I can make the, the molecule on the bottom look like the molecule on the top. So these are, in, in fact, although they look different, they really are the same PCB. So one more here. Uh, and this is the same kind of thing. They look different. But if I were to take the molecule on the bottom, flip it around as though I were walking behind the screen, and then flip it over, top to bottom, I can make it look, without changing it at all, I can make it look like the one on the top. So these are also the same exact PCB. One more, and then we'll move on to something else. What do you think about this one? Different? Different? Same? The answer is, and this one's a little tricky, 
that this is in fact the same. Why? It's, you know, I can't, I can't walk around behind the screen and make it look different, make it look the, the same. I can't flip it over and make it look the same. What do I have to do to make it look the same? I've got to take this ring and twist it up. Okay? Now, see this? This is a single bond. The molecule is capable of rotating around that single bond. All right? Now, why do we care? We'll find out at the end of the talk, but I would like you to remember <laughs> Just remember for now that, uh, that the PCB, the bond between the two six-carbon rings, allows the molecule to rotate. And we'll come back to that, and it's very important for the toxicological properties of PCBs. All right, so we've got 10, car, uh, 10 chlorines to play with. We can put them in different configurations. And when we get done, if you go through all of the exercise that we just went through and you ask yourself, how many are really different? There are, in fact, 209 different ways that you can add up to 10 chlorines on a biphenyl structure. Now, not all of these, in fact, were synthesized as part of arachlores, and we're getting ahead of our own story. We'll talk about arachlores in a second. But there were perhaps, and it depends a little bit on, on how you define, did they exist in the mixture? There were arguably something on the order of about 175 different PCB molecules, congeners as we call them, that in fact were, uh, were part of the arachlores. So we're really talking about a family of chemicals, and that's one of the most important things to remember when you're thinking about PCBs. Not a single chemical, a family of chemicals. They all have different properties. So sometimes people will ask us, are PCBs volatile or are they not volatile? And the answer is yes. Do they biodegrade or do they not biodegrade? Yes. Do they dissolve or do they not dissolve? Yes. Right. They do all of these things in different, different proportions because they are different chemicals and they behave differently in the environment. Now, PCBs that have the same level of chlorination, so if they have two chlorines, three chlorines, that kind of thing, they're known as being members of the same homolog group. And homologs tend to, and there are exceptions, there are exceptions to almost everything I'm going to tell you tonight, PCB homologs tend to behave similarly. So the group of seven chlorine biphenyls versus the group of six chlorines, five chlorines, they have properties that tend to be similar. Not always, there are exceptions, but they do tend to behave that way. Now, what are arachlores? Arachlores are mixtures of congeners, mixtures of individual PCB molecules that were formulated to have particular physical properties. So a typical arachlor, and this varies again, uh, had perhaps 50 or so individual congeners. Arachlor was a trade name of the Monsanto company, and in other countries, uh, PCBs were known by different names, but most of the PCBs used in this country, the vast majority of them, were manufactured by Monsanto and were known by the name Arachlor. The, the, the Arachlor is followed by a number, and the significance of that is the first two digits, there were always 12, with one exception, always 12 something. The first two digits are just 12 because they refer, again, to the number of carbons in the two rings. And then the second two digits, which are really the important ones, and we'll be talking more about that, was the overall weight percent of chlorine in the mixture. So Arachlor 1242 was 42 percent by weight chlorine. Arachlor 1260 was 60 percent by weight chlorine. There's one exception to that, it doesn't really matter, but 1016 you'll see. 1016 is approximately a 1241. But, uh, for, uh, for reasons uh, that I frankly don't fully understand, uh, that particular one was called 1016. Arachlor has varied from about 1210 to 1260. Now, as I mentioned, the physical behavior of the uh, PCB molecules, once congeners, once they get into the environment, is governed by the number of chlorines. And the names uh, are, are, there are different names for each of these homolog groups. We won't go through them all, but they're basically the Greek prefixes for numbers. So tri is three, tetra is four, so on. The other thing is that 
uh, it's a little bit like rolling dice. Uh, if you think of the two PCB rings as dice, uh, if, you, if you roll a pair of dice, you know there's only one way that you can get two. But there are a lot of ways you can get seven. So as a result, there were only three, or there are only three ways to build a monochloro PCB, one that only has one chlorine. So there are only three of those, but there are more of the dichloro PCBs, a lot of pentas and hexas, those would be the fives and the sixes, and then, the, you, then you get less again. Uh, so that most of the, the PCB congeners fall into these, these middle groups. Now, as the number of chlorines increases, as we move through from the mono through to the decachloro PCBs, they tend to be, and again, I will caveat that by saying that there certainly are exceptions, but they tend to be less volatile. So as you add chlorines, PCBs tend to be less volatile, and in fact, you don't have to add too many chlorines before they're really not volatile at all. They're also less biodegradable. Uh, the ones that have a lot of chlorine tend to be very difficult to degrade. They also, and this is very important for transport in the river, and we'll hear more about that tomorrow night, but they're more strongly attached to sediment particles. They tend to partition onto the particles and travel with the sediment. Now, if you're a, a PCB molecule and you happen to be attached to a grain of sand or, or a piece of, uh, uh, of mud, a little bit of silt, you're going to travel along with that silt and you're going to be traveling very differently from another PCB congener that happens to be dissolved in the water because the water is moving differently from the sediment. So this, this particular property is very important for transport. And they also tend to be lipophilic. Again, this is from the Greek, lipo, fat, lipid, the same kind of uh, root. Philic uh, means love, so fat loving. PCBs are fat loving. When they get in your body, they tend to uh, head right into the fat, dissolve in the fat, and uh, as a result, they tend to bioaccumulate in living organisms. So with regard to arachlores, less chlorinated arachlores, those are the ones with the lower numbers, the 1210, 1242, uh, that range, they tend to be lighter oils. As the arachlores are more chlorinated, the higher numbers, 1260, 1268, they tend to be heavy, heavier oils, waxy solids. Now, the PCBs that were used at the GE facility in Pittsfield were mostly 1260, towards the heavier, more chlorinated end of the range of arachlores. Those are the ones that tended to be used in the bigger transformers, and it was the big transformers that were worked on here. Uh, there was some 1254 used as well, but mostly 1260, and just by way of comparison, the PCBs that are in the Hudson River were largely 1242. Uh, and I mention that because you need to be careful comparing uh, what might be going on in the Hudson issues with regard to transport, toxicity, biodegradation. All of these things are, while there are some similarities, there are also some very important differences because the PCBs that were used in the Hudson are really quite a different formulation from the PCBs that were used here. The other thing about, about PCBs is that, or about arachlores, is that as soon as they're in the environment, they start to look different. And this uh, can be a, a problem for identifying arachlores in the environment. As soon as it's introduced, you know, or as soon as an arachlore is introduced into the river, the lighter ones start volatilizing. The ones that are more soluble start dissolving in the water, and they go over this way, and the heavier ones are attached to the particles that sink to the bottom. So after a while, that arachlor begins to look different than it did when it came out of the drum. This process is called weathering. Now the PCBs that are out in the, the Housatonic, again, 1260, 1254, because they are primarily the more chlorinated congeners, tend to show very little evidence of weathering, and we, we've done studies to compare the congener structure of the arachlors that are in the river and in the floodplain with the original formulation as they came out of the drum, and there really is very, very little difference. So there's been very little weathering in the river. So PCBs, uh, as we've indicated, are stable. They're persistent. They are ubiquitous in the environment. I know that, that many of you have, uh, have come to listen to uh, Dr. David Carpenter talk about PCBs in the Arctic. Uh, we all have PCBs in our bodies. Virtually every living thing has PCBs, and they, they are ubiquitous uh, everywhere. They tend to 
not volatilized, as I said, but some congeners are volatile. They tend to adsorb to particles, which means that they're relatively insoluble. Just to give you an idea, uh, scientists use a term called the partitioning coefficient, or you'll see sometimes KD, a large K with a small d, or KP sometimes, and that refers to the amount of uh, a PCB, whether it be a congener or an aerochlor, uh, that is uh, the concentration that is on a particle versus what is dissolved in the water. And that number is usually given as the power of 10. So for example, 6 might be a typical partitioning coefficient for a PCB. What that means is 10 to the 6, or a million. So for every one molecule that is dissolved in the water, there are a million molecules that are attached to the sediment. So these, these materials tend to stay with the sediment, although uh, remember that there's relatively little sediment in water, especially when the, when the river is not in flood. So even though most of the concentration is on the particles, there aren't that many particles there. So there's still PCBs in the water, and as you'll hear in the, in the modeling talk tomorrow, it's very important to keep track of not only the PCBs that are on the sediment, but also the PCBs that are in the water. All right, they partition to organic carbon. Um, and that means not just, uh, not just organic carbon, uh, meaning us, but also organic carbon that is uh, in the environment. We talked about partitioning into lipids. As a result of that, they bioaccumulate. What does that mean? They enter our bodies or bodies of other living things, and they tend to reach higher concentrations in the bodies of the animals than they, than they are at in the water or in the sediment. They also biomagnify. And what that means is that as the PCBs move up the food chain, they concentrate. Now, as you know, if you eat 10 pounds of food, you don't put on 10 pounds of weight. If you're like me, you put on 15 pounds of weight. Uh, but you put on, in round numbers, in order to maintain about a pound of weight, you have to eat 10 pounds of food. But you retain all of the PCBs that were in that 10 pounds of food. So as the PCBs move up the food chain, with every step in the food chain, they magnify. And that's why the higher level organisms, higher trophic level organisms, as we call them, have higher concentrations of PCBs. As we mentioned, they biodegrade slowly, if at all. Again, uh, very congener dependent. The biodegradation of PCBs is of, of particular interest that's been studied extensively and, and uh, actually was studied over a period of years by GE uh, using sediments in wood, Woods Pond and also conducting studies in Woods Pond, some very, very good work that was done over the years. Uh, and what that work found was that uh, the, the rates, the occurrence of, of biodegradation, whether it happens at all, how it happens, and how quickly it happens varies uh, greatly by congener. No surprise there. There are both aerobic and anaerobic. What that means is there are bacteria that uh, live uh, in the presence of oxygen and others that do not. Both can degrade PCBs by different pathways. Uh, but there are, there are problems. Biodegradation pathways often don't carry through to completion. So you might start with one PCB congener. It biodegrades to another PCB congener. You really haven't gained a whole lot if that happens. Uh, also, there can be other toxic compounds that are created along the way. And, as we mentioned, the more highly chlorinated congeners show virtually no biodegradation for a couple of reasons. They, uh, the ones that have a lot of chlorines are naturally resistant to biodegradation, and also they're very tightly bound to the sediment particles, that high KD number that we talked about, and that uh, uh, prevents biodegradation as well. As a result, the more highly chlorinated congeners, and I'll mention again that we're dealing with the more highly chlorinated congeners here in the Housatonic, have half-lives that can be measured in decades to centuries. So they biodegrade very, very slowly, and if biodegradation were left to occur naturally, we'd be looking at, at many, many years uh, before there was a significant change in the concentration. Nonetheless, uh, people continue to look for ways to biodegrade PCBs, and there are reports out there, and uh, I, I know uh, there are some that have been brought to our attention. We've, we've looked into it. We're hoping to look into it further, uh, that in fact, uh, there are ways to enhance biodegradation if you can excavate material. Uh, 
and treat it in certain ways, adding certain amendments, uh, farming it by, by turning it over. Um, but unfortunately, there's currently no practical means of large-scale enhanced biodegradation in situ. So you, you can't uh, spread uh, a material on a surface and let it percolate in naturally and enhance biodegradation. That would be a wonderful thing if someone's able to work that out. As of now, they've not been able to do that. With regard to toxicity, just a couple of uh, slides. PCBs, as I, I think virtually everyone here knows, have been shown to cause cancer. Uh, they also have other non-cancer effects. There are multiple agencies around the world that classify PCBs as probable human carcinogens. Now, what do we mean by probable? What that means is that PCBs have been demonstrated in controlled laboratory studies to cause cancer in animals. It's a little hard to get people to, qual to volunteer for those studies, so there have been no studies uh, in laboratories that have dosed people with PCBs, obviously, and caused cancer. But obviously, much of what we know about how drugs work in our bodies, and virtually all drugs are developed on, on lower animal models, we have a, a body of literature that allows us to translate effects on animals to humans. And uh, that is why they're classified as probable. They cause cancer in laboratory animals. They are assumed to cause cancer in humans. Uh, and this occurs both at elevated laboratory concentrations and at environmental concentrations. And there are numerous studies in the peer-reviewed literature uh, of just a wealth of information on the toxicological effects of PCBs. Now, who remembers about the, the bond? <laughs> we said we'd come back to it. Here's that bond that, uh, that the molecule can move around. Now, I've named the different carbons. Uh, these are positions around the molecule. The one we care about for this little discussion is this ortho position. Now, chlorine uh, is a, a very strong electron attractor, and as a result, when there are chlorines on the molecule, the electrons are spending a lot of time around the chlorines. And as a result, those chlorines are carrying negative charges. So if we put a chlorine in this position and in this position here, here, what happens, as everyone knows, like charges repel. So those negatively charged chlorines, uh, tough to do with this microphone, if you can picture the two rings on the PCBs as being like two dinner plates. Those negative charges that are close to each other tend to twist those two plates out of alignment. All right? They can't lie in the same plane. They can't lie flat on a tabletop because those negative charges have twisted the molecule. It's the ones that don't have the negative charges that we care about. The PCB congeners that do not have chlorines in the ortho positions are the ones that can lie flat. We term that coplanar. All right, coplanar. They don't have PCBs in the ortho positions. Because they can lie flat, the structure mimics that of dioxin, which, as you know, is a very toxic chemical. There are, in fact, 12 PCBs that are so called coplanar PCBs. They don't have or, uh, chlorines in the ortho positions. And as a result, they lie in a flat plane, and they mimic the structure of dioxin, uh, and so they exhibit toxicity similar to dioxin. So here we have a PCB. A congener has a couple of chlorines over here, has three chlorines over on this side, and you'll see nothing in the ortho positions. There are a couple of different ways that we can name this, all of these uh, Carbon positions have numbers, so this is three here, uh, here, three, three prime, we go to the other ring, four, four prime, five prime. All right, one ring has the straight numbers, the other has the prime. Move through this. Uh, if, you, if you like, another way of naming it, uh, somewhat simpler, is three, four, three, four, five PCB. And then all of the PCB congeners have been assigned numbers, all 209 of them. And on page 12 of your handout, there's a periodic table of the PCBs uh, that shows all of the numbers that have been assigned. And this particular 
congener happens to be PCB-126, which is the most dioxin-like of all of the PCBs, exhibits a toxicity that's about 10% that of dioxin. Uh, and it's the most dioxin-like of all the 209 congeners. Uh, Donna Voorhees, who has promised me she won't be wearing a navy blazer and khaki slacks uh, tomorrow, will be, uh, will be here to talk more about PCB toxicity. So, tomorrow night, maybe the weather will be better. I hope it will be better. I hope you'll all be here. A very interesting series of presentations. We're going to learn a lot more about where the PCBs are out there. Where are they in the river? Where are they in the floodplain? Uh, how they got there? How they, how they move in the river, how they get out onto the floodplain, um, what the toxic effects are, both on humans, the human health risk assessment, and the, uh, the ecological risk assessment, and then also how the model, you've heard a lot about the model, I'm sure. Some of you probably have a pretty good idea of what it is, perhaps some of you don't. We'll learn a lot more about the, the Housatonic River model, how it was developed, and how it's being used to predict where the PCBs will go in the future uh, not, under, not just under a no-action alternative, but uh, under different remedial alternatives that are being looked at. So uh, I hope that, uh, that you'll be able to make it. Uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. I, th I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll be glad to entertain any questions. Good. Thank you, Dick. There, there, there's just a couple of questions, and then we'll bring the full panel out uh, and wrap up the evening. Uh, one question is, how did they come to the conclusion that PCBs are dangerous? Well, by dangerous, I'm, I'm assuming toxic. Uh, laboratory studies and also uh, back in the, in the 70s, uh, there were uh, shorebirds that, uh, that were found washed up on a beach in large numbers, and, and those were tested and found to contain high levels of PCBs. But it's primarily a combination of uh, observation of natural events like that and controlled laboratory studies with PCBs. Okay. And what is the relationship of PCBs and other contaminants, for example, dioxin, which you talked a bit tonight about, and, and has other contaminants been identified in the Housatonic? Uh, answer the, the first part of that question first. Um, Contaminants in the environment are generally assumed in, in the absence of information to the contrary to not act synergistically. You know? So what that means is that uh, if, uh, if a particular toxin, whether it be PCBs or, or any other toxin, is at a certain concentration, it has a certain effect. And if there are other toxins present, they have their own independent effects. There are some documented cases of, of synergy uh, and I, I think we, we know uh, intuitively, and also from laboratory studies, that many of these, these uh, chemicals can act synergistically, but uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to understand that relationship quantitatively. Uh, so they're, they're assumed, in the absence of, of data otherwise, to, to act independently. And the, I'm sorry, the second part was? What was it? Oh. Oh, the second part was, um, have any other contaminants been identified in the Satanic River? No, not really, no. There, are, there are, uh, Obviously, there are, are contaminants just about everywhere in, in uh, concentrations of, of some kind, but uh, in uh, concentrations that would, would give us concern with the exception of the related chemicals. Dioxins and furans uh, are uh, commonly associated with PCBs, uh, and, and they, are, they are in the river, certainly, uh, but they, they tend to uh, they tend to move in a very similar way to the, to the PCBs. Uh, and uh, the focus we, we did in the risk assessment, and I'm, I'm sure Donna will, will address this tomorrow, uh, look at dioxins and furans as, as well as PCBs. But the, uh, the focus remains on the PCBs. OK. Uh, one more question, uh, four parts. Uh, I'll go one at a time. Can you verify that low MWPCBs, those that can volatize, are found in higher concentrations in trees, I think it's trees, up to three miles from the river. And what about in agricultural crops grown in the floodplain? I have no, uh, I have no data. I, I mean, I'm aware of work that has been done uh, 
again through Dr. Carpenter's uh, group that has uh, found PCBs in trees and tree bark at, uh, at uh, remote areas from a source. Um, I have no direct information on that myself, so I'd, I'd not uh, care to comment on that. Um, the second part? I'm sorry. What about agricultural crops grown in the floodplain? Uh, Donna, Donna will be talking about this tomorrow and at, uh, at some length, and so I, I would hesitate to, uh, to steal her thunder, uh, but she, she will deal with the agricultural issue, uh, and not just uh, crops in the sense of uh, produce, but also crops such as uh, eggs, uh, for, uh, beef production, and, and those kinds of things. So I, I would encourage you to come back tomorrow night to listen to that. Uh, can I assume, this is someone from the community asking, can I assume that high PCBs stay in the sediment and are not volatile? The, the higher molecular weight PCBs uh, do, uh, and again, they're, we're talking about 200 different molecules, each with their own behavior, but as a gener general rule, the higher chlorinated PCBs are strongly associated with the sediment, do not... Uh, dissolve in the water and do not volatilize. Okay. How deep in the riverbed are PCBs found? We, uh, the river, uh, and some of the previous speakers touched on this briefly, the, the river, uh, particularly, particularly during flood events, uh, is very active. The sediment column can be virtually entirely remobilized and we find PCBs, not everywhere, but in many locations, down through the entire sediment column to what was the, uh, the clay bed of glacial Lake Housatonic that, that Rich talked about. And, and that, that, is a, that is a floor, because that, that uh, clay uh, glacial Lake Housatonic bed does not get disturbed um, during storms, so that, uh, that does not contain PCBs. But everything above it does. What does the partition coefficient indicate about PCBs that have volatized? Well, it, it doesn't indicate anything about them because the uh, partition coefficient refers to uh, PCBs that are dissolved versus PCBs that are attached to sediment particles. So if a PCB has volatilized, the partition coefficient no, no longer has any meaning for it. Okay. Uh, another four-part question. Uh, are 1260 PCBs more or less toxic than 1242? Again, I think that's a better question for, for Donna Voorhees tomorrow night. Uh, there, there, there are differences in toxicity, and uh, uh, I, I would just recommend asking Donna that question tomorrow. Okay. Is there a concern regarding dried mud kicking up as dust and being inhaled? Fugitive dust is a, uh, is a concern. Uh, that was part of the, the human health risk assessment, um, which looked at activities in the floodplain and how much dust would be kicked up by the, uh, by the particular activity. And uh, then they looked not, uh, not just at inhalation and ingestion, but also dust that, uh, or, or mud that might land on skin surface and absorption through the skin. So that was one of the pathways that was considered in the risk assessment. How do we absorb PCBs and other, other than eating them? Other than eating them? Yeah. Well, uh, in, inhalation is, uh, is very similar to, uh, to ingestion, really. Uh, and the other way would be, would be uh, passage through the skin, so cutaneous uh, absorption. Okay. Are the Housatonic River PCBs the 126 PCBs? Uh, I, 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 think, I think I understand the question. I, I think uh, someone is asking if, if congener 126 is one of the congeners that occurs in the, in the river. Uh, if, if that's the case, the answer is, is uh, yes, but fortunately in very, very low concentrations. Okay. And how is dioxin like our PCBs? The the similarity is that they have the same method of, of toxicity in the body. 
they, they act on a particular part of an enzyme system that involves something called the aryl hydrocarbon uh, receptor and it disrupts this, uh, this hormone system. I'm, I'm not a toxicologist uh, and uh, neither do I play one on TV, but, uh, but, that, but in, in essence, uh, because of this coplanar situation, uh, the, the PCBs have the same action uh, as dioxin. One last question for you, Dick. If there are no new PCBs, how are there still PCBs in the water? Can they jump from sediment to water? Yes. Um, well, they can do it in, in two ways, really, even though they are, and, and again, it's a lot of variability, but generally speaking, even though they're not particularly soluble, they're not insoluble. So there are, there are PCBs that are in the sediment that can uh, be fluxed into the water column and dissolve, and also uh, during uh, storm events, certainly, but also in normal uh, river processes, the, uh, the sediments can be, uh, and especially silty sediments, fine sediments, clays, silts, can be kicked up into the water column, and then the PCBs uh, will travel for a considerable time and a considerable distance on those clay particles because they, they settle back out very slowly. Okay, thank you. We're going to bring the, uh, yeah, g give Dick a hand. We're going to uh, take a break, take a quick one minute change to bring some chairs out. We'll have the full panel out for cross, cross cutting questions across all the disciplines. I appreciate everyone um, remaining patient and staying focused. I know it's late and there's a lot of information that's been exchanged tonight, and I, I hope that having the full panel out here will be just as interesting as the, the first four presentations were. Uh, this question is for Dick. Would it be a good idea to study PCBs further before going ahead with remediation? I guess in, in my own mind, I'm, I'm not sure if the question is, is asking, uh, should we study the basic chemistry of PCBs or should we study uh, where they are and, and in what concentrations they occur in the river? I'll, I'll actually, and I'll answer both questions. And the answer to both questions is, is uh, no. Uh, in, in the first case, uh, the chemistry of PCBs is quite well understood. Uh, we certainly understand them well enough to uh, look at remedial alternatives for the river and answer the question of uh, whether remediation is, is appropriate, and if so, how to do it. Uh, with regard to the second question, I've worked on a number of hazardous waste sites, a number of PCB sites. Uh, I have never in, in my career, 40 years now, seen a site that has been studied as extensively as this one. Uh, we have been accused at times of uh, trying to remediate the river by sampling it, and uh, there, <laughs> There's, uh, there's, there's some validity to that criticism, I'm afraid. Uh, there, we have thousands of, uh, of environmental samples. I, I th I'm not sure exactly what the number is. It, it's well over 10,000. Um, in all media, we, we've sampled the sediment. We've sampled all of the uh, various biota, or at least enough of them, to, to know where the PCBs are. We've been out in the floodplain. We've been down to, what, Rich, 10 feet in the floodplain? Uh, 10 feet in the sediments, uh, uh, there, uh, we have the information we need. Uh, there, there's really no point in continuing the sampling program at this point. Okay. Second question, I, I want to um, just again thank you for your patience and for um, st staying here for this. Um, this is directed to Rich and the, the history of, of the river. Uh, slide number 29, I don't know if you could recall, maybe John could pull it up. Uh, there's a split map, uh, and the question is, where is the sewage disposal area noted on the second map? What is there now, and what has become of that? Well, obviously, not seeing the, the individual slide, I suspect. Uh, well, that, he's pulling it up. John's pulling it up. 29. 29. Oh, one more, John. There we go. Okay, so the, uh, the, the, the 
topographic map on the right-hand side is from 1944. The one on the left is 1886. Um, the sewage disposal facility you see on the right-hand panel um, did not exist in 1886. It was installed after that point in time. That's why you're not seeing it on the, on the older topographic map. What was there in 1886? Um, I don't know. What is there now? What is oh. there now and what has become of it? Um, the sewage treatment plant is there. It's, it's still there. Uh, not all the ponds are being used, but, but in the current photo you would still see um, a lot of those topographic features. Pardon me? Uh, New Alex Road is, is just at the bottom of the, of the diagram. Sure, so there have been studies done all over the country in different physiographic regions, given different climate regimes, of looking at rivers in a stable state or in that dynamic equilibrium and studying the erosion, studying the, the erosion and deposition rates of those rivers. And so using that as a baseline, using similar rivers and simil similar physiographic regimes, similar geologic regimes, using those rivers as a baseline, then we can determine based on a specific instance whether the erosion rates at a given river exceed or don't exceed those averages for those study rivers sites. Just ha talk loud. <laughs> has the cleanup of the two miles changed the stability of the river downstream? Yeah, I think that was similar to one of the questions that was asked earlier. And, and you know, in the cleanup in the, the mile and a half and half mile reach, the morphology of the channel wasn't changed that much. Obviously, rock was added to the channel. There was a capping process that occurred and rock was added to the channel. So because the morphology of the channel didn't change that much, it, it won't have a, a drastic effect downstream because the sediment size changed we may see some changes downstream over a, a long period of time because we're transporting that energy dissipation that would occur upstream to downstream, but that might happen over a long period of time. Okay. Uh, and, and for Keith and Rich, if you want to jump in as well, there, there is no disputing that the river has been disturbed, but would you agree that it is trending towards a more natural state below the confluence in the PSA. Yeah, so I think that any time a river has some kind of disturbance happen to it, whether it's a change in land cover or land use, or whether, whether a stream bank gets blown out from an erosion process, or whether a tree falls into the stream and changes the, the hydraulics and stresses on the stream bank there, that rivers, given the opportunity, will tend to reestablish that dynamic equilibrium over time. So that's in fact what we're seeing on the Housatonic from those changes in land use and disturbances over the past two, three hundred years, we're seeing that river recover on its own. When it recovers on its own, it takes a long period of time for that to happen. And if you add disturbances in between, then you get sort of this effect, this compounding effect of these disturbances and their impacts and effects on the river system. And so in some cases, it's, it's always in flux or trying to recover from that. In other cases, it is slowly recovering and over a long period of time, given no more, no more alterations to the hydrology, the hydraulics, the sediment transport, the river will recover. Okay. Uh, and for you, Keith, again, how did the remediation that was done in Pittsfield affect the hydromorphology downstream and upstream? I guess again, just the, you know, the same, the same answer. It's basically that the morphology of the channel didn't change. The sediment, size sediment in the channel changed, and that will transport energy downstream and could, over a long period of time, have some effect downstream. But it might be so subtle that we may not see it for years or may not really see it at all. Okay. So. And I think this is for Rich, uh, or maybe Keith as well. 
The history of the river shows that it has been drastically modified, including clear cutting along its banks and even has been rerouted, such as in the 1940s, and became the system that exists today, then won't the thorough cleaning of the river of PCBs result in a clean, swimmable, fishable river with renewed and flourishing ecological environment? With a renewed and flourishing ecological envir environment. I, I think, you know, what John pointed out about how resilient river, rivers are and given enough time, rivers will recover from those disturbances. If we look at adding in a process of rest, active, re and I kind of call that passive restoration, where the river on its own is recovering from those disturbances in a passive way. If we add in active restoration after a disturbance, such as a, the potential to remediate the river, um, then that active restoration can greatly accelerate that process of recovery. And that's something that we'll talk about Wednesday night. Uh, and for John, how can the younger generation get involved to help protect our local environment? Uh, study in school. <laughs> I think the first thing is to uh, is to get a good foundation in science and learn to become a good unbiased scientist and get engaged in some of the things that are going on in your community and tend to understand them. A lot of times there's a lot of hype in both areas. Both uh, There's a lot of opinions that fly out there and I try to encourage people to collectively uh, analyze the data in an unbiased manner and, and generate opinions that we do using the scientific method. I think seeing the amount of young people here tonight is really great, really good. Yeah. This is for John, I believe. What are the odds of successful breeding of bald eagles near the river um, to peace? What are the odds of successful breeding of bald eagles near the river, it looks like a 20? to PCB levels? I think the question is, at current levels of PCBs in the river and with the fish that are there, um, if they were to nest, how would they be successful? Um, based on the model we did in the risk assessment, the, fish, the PCB levels in the fish are elevated above a level at which they'd be successful. So they wouldn't likely be successful. We do address that in the risk assessment. And it sounds like there was little success man-made vernal pools. This is for John. Do, do you know a more successful way of doing it now? Well, again, I, I don't want to in, in, misinterpret the question. I'm not sure where that came from or what that was, if it's talking about the one vernal pool that was constructed. And the one vernal pool that was constructed um, right by the confluence was uh, an interesting site in that it was significantly compromised uh, as it started out. So um, it wasn't like a pristine vernal pool to start with. So um, from that standpoint, you have to be careful how you answer that question. Did the pool get reestablished in a manner that's similar to what existed? Yes. So it was successful from that, from that standpoint. Could we do it in a better manner? In my opinion, yes. So, and then have vernal pools been established elsewhere successfully? Yes. For Dick, when did we start discharging PCBs in the Housatonic and for how long? The uh, PCBs were used at the GE facility from about 1932 to 1977. Um, we don't have specific information on, on whether the uh, discharge started uh, immediately upon their first use, but I, I think we can safely assume that if, if it didn't happen uh, then, it was shortly thereafter. But that, that's the span, about 1932 to 1977. Okay, and for John, if there are PCBs on the species, what does that mean? Are they inside their bodies, outside their bodies? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think uh, it, the, uh, for the organisms that we sampled, um, they were uh, attempting primarily to sample the concentrations that were in the tissue. Um, 
many of the organisms are in contact with the sediment, so if they have sediment that's attached to their bodies, there's going to be some that are absorbed to the sediment, as, as Dick pointed out in his, in his talk. So um, yes is the answer to both of them. Okay. And for Keith, since rivers want to meander, then why don't we try to not change its behavior? Well, I, I think, um, I'm not sure I quite understand that question, but if we're talking about the potential to do any type of remediation or the potential to do any type of restoration, we would build in a process for the river to meander um, as a natural river would. Uh, for Dick, what was the date year of the GE biodegradation degradation study in Woods Pond? There may be somebody else here who uh, can can answer. My recollection is that that work was done in the, in the 1990s, but I'm I'm honestly not sure if that's correct. Again, all the all the questions are going to um, go up on the website, and we'll, we'll have a more specific response there. Uh, these questions are more for Wednesday. I'm going to read them um, the best that I can, uh, and, and it may be that you may you may respond. Um, how, do, how do you show that PCBs in the river threaten human health and those living along the river? Are the PCBs are airborne and hasn't EPA tested the air around the river and found no contamination? Dick, you may want to. The, the first part of the, of the risk assessment was to do some screening studies with regard to different environmental media. There were samples taken of the air along the river, different locations. There were also samples taken of the water. The concentrations that were present in those, in those two media were compared to screening uh, guidelines that, uh, that EPA has promulgated that were actually uh, developed by EPA Region 9, which is the Pacific Northwest uh, area headquartered in Seattle. They're called the PRG's Preliminary Remediation Goals, and they are conservative screening numbers that uh, if you have a concentration that does not exceed these numbers, you can have confidence, because they are conservative, that there's not a risk there. So that work was done early on in, in the risk assessment. The, uh, the concentrations in the water, I'm talking now the, the water specifically, not, not river sediment, uh, and the air. Uh, were compared to those uh, Region 9 uh, PRGs, and they fell below those screening guidelines. So those two media were eliminated from further consideration in the risk assessment. OK. Uh, didn't the, Dick, this is a follow-up, didn't the Mass Department of Public Health find no elevated blood levels around Allendale Skull population and the Lakewood population? My, uh, my understanding is that, 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 is, that is correct. Uh, we, um, I, I will let them uh, defend their, their own study. Um, uh, blood is, is not a, a particularly good uh, tissue for uh, looking for PCBs. We talked about how they're lipophilic. Uh, it's a very easy tissue to sample. It's, it's, it's not too difficult to get people to give blood samples. It's somewhat more difficult to get them to give uh, other tissue. Uh, so uh, as a result, the, the studies tend to be done uh, with blood. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not, I'm not a toxicologist. I don't know the details uh, of, of that uh, blood study uh, other than to, uh, to say that I, I believe it's correct that they did not find elevated levels of PCBs, but uh, beyond that, I, I would uh, let the, the mass DPH defend their own work. Uh, I have two final questions that the panel is not going to address tonight. They will address Thursday night, um, so it's an opportunity for folks to come back and hear these responses. Um, is, is there a, looks like a suction system, not dredging, 
which would discern between PCBs and vertebrates and vertebrates to return all basic, all back to the environment. Hard time reading this. Um, such as burnt, burnt or bacteria, etc. I think who, whoever uh, wrote this, if you're if you're here and you want to see me after, we we'll, we'll get to it Thursday night, and I could you could clarify the, the the language. The second question for Thursday is what did the EPA learn from the first two mile cleanup, and how does the EPA plan to apply these lessons to the rest of the river re remediation? Uh, so again, th these are going to be strategy type discussions uh, that the EPA is considering and will address in, in much greater detail on Thursday night. Um, with that, I want to thank the panel for the work that they put in for these informative, thoughtful presentations. I want to thank the community for being here, staying with us, uh, asking some very good questions, keeping us focused. And again, I hope you come back tomorrow night. If not, uh, we'll be up on the website, the videos from each of the evenings. All the, all the PowerPoints will be up on the website. And if you have any questions, uh, the guys will be sticking around for a couple of minutes. But they've been here all day and pretty, 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 pretty looped at this point. <laughs> Just from. You can submit questions on the website. You can submit questions going out the door. There's an evaluation. If you have any comments about how the evening went, your experience of it, anything you'd like to see improved, modified. Yes? Thank you.